welcome to the first installment of the Cordo Coaching Chronicles. I'm Alex. I'm joined here by Nathan, uh, the coach E for today uh, and for the remainder of this of these chronicles. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I am a full-time magic content creator. I write articles for Channel Fireball. I have a podcast called Limited Level Ups, and I am a full-time magic coach for the most part. Uh, I coach people three or four times a week in draft, specifically in Limited, uh, helping people attain their goals to get better at Limited uh, in, in from, you know, from being very beginners and some more intermediate players. I've helped people train for uh, drafting on the Pro Tour. And so really my, my whole goal, my whole idea as a content creator and a coach is just helping people get better. You know, I play a ton of Limited and if I can translate that to helping people, that's my main goal. A uh, little word on this project, this video. Uh, this is a project to kind of display the coaching method. Um, I think when people think magic coaching, they're like, what is that? Like, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Um, and one of the goals, aside from just being educational content for you, the viewer, uh, and, you know, entertaining content, hopefully, is to kind of demystify what it means to be engaged with magic coaching and what it means to get magic coaching. Um, and of course, the of course, it's like I've mentioned before, the secondary thing is to just be educational content where maybe you're not looking to get coaching yourself, but you're looking to level up your own game. It's nice to have a little look in on somebody who is getting coaching. Uh, and the third reason for this project, our the impetus, is this is going to be a charity based project. So um, we are, you know, the one of the main goals when we started this uh, was to give back to the community in some way. So any uh, anything made off of this project revenue wise uh, is going to go towards New Haven Learning Center, which is a uh, nonprofit dedicated to helping out individuals with autism. It's a local nonprofit to me. Um, for those who don't know, uh, some people who might follow my stream might know, but I imagine most people don't know, I have I, I'm personally related to them because I have two brothers with autism. Um, so a lot of my life has been dedicated to uh, autism awareness and just, you know, helping out people in need, basically, that, that do have autism. Um, so our goal not only is to make sure that, you know, people are a little bit more aware, but would like to, if they'd like to donate to a good cause, they can do so. And tied to this project, we're going to have uh, a link. It'll probably be down below in the description. If you'd like to donate directly, you can do so. That's enough talking for me. Let's uh, let's go to Nathan. Nathan, how's it going? Hey, how are you? I'm I'm good. Uh, so I'm sure you know I gave a little bit of my background. I'm sure the people would like to hear a little bit about you and your magic background. Yeah, I'm definitely the lesser known commodity between the two of us. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nathan. I, I've been playing magic off and on since 1994. I'm one of those people that kind of came in fits and spurts. I started playing in middle school uh, with revised and then I uh, got burnt out after fallen empire slash I was a little kid. So I got probably distracted by super Nintendo or whatever the new thing was at the time. You got, you, uh, you, you didn't like that. fallen empires, the critically acclaimed set fallen empires. I, I actually really did. A, a good friend of mine who, who played with me at the time has a complete set of fallen empires still. And he keeps reaching out to me. He's like, do you think this is going to be worth anything? I'm like, no. <laughs> no, sorry. It's sorry, anything. man. <laughs> But, but Homerids and like, what was it? Sea Singer, they have like a, a, a like a soft spot in my heart. I, I loved them. But yeah, I, I loved it then. And then, but you know, little kid got distracted. And then I came back after college, right, it was around the mir mirrored in time frame. And I played pretty consistently from mir mirrored into even tide. And that was, um, you know, just constructed slash tabletop magic, if you will. I would go to the, the FNMs, but I was just bringing some homebrew jank that I, I put together. And then I went to grad school and then I came back in Kaladesh. So, hmm. you know, it kind of fits and spurts. And I've been playing pretty consistently since Kaladesh. Came back and constructed, really found limited at the time and loved it and started playing in limited and modern. I, I would say, you know, for those people seeing me or for the first time or what, trying to relate, you know, what is a coaching session with you going to be like uh, to this Nathan guy? I think I'm a pretty average player. I, I, have done really well in constructed. Like I played in uh, GP Vegas and got 72nd a couple of years ago. So, like I can play well in constructed tournaments. I I get the concepts. I'm you know I know when I miss triggers or things like that. But I I've never been really successful when Arena came out or playing in MTGO. I'm like always a middle of the road, uh, you know 500ish player just to give people data points. 
Uh, for Zendikar Rising, it's the first time I installed 17 lands, so I have actual metrics on everything. Um, I played 54 drafts. I got six trophies. I had 17 winning drafts, but unfortunately, 36 losing drafts. So <laughs> you can see that a lion's share of the winning came in, you know, just a couple of, of drafts there. Um, and the impetus for the show was uh, I have a lot of hobbies in my life that I have gone and taken professional classes for. I've taken a lot of photography classes. I've gotten, I'm a, I'm a big golfer, I'm a big skier. I've gotten, you know, taken group lessons there or gotten one on ones. And I've seen my skills in those areas rise tremendously. And I realized I really like magic, but there's not a lot of content out there that's kind of, like you said, demystifying what the coaching process was like. And I see a lot of people offering coaching. So I, I was on your stream one day and I was like, you know, he, he offers coaching. Let's, let's reach out and, and, and see if he wants to partner to make some content around this to uh, share what the learning process is going to be like. Uh -huh. So uh, this is my first foray into magic coaching. But, you know, like I said, I've been doing it for so many years and never taken it really seriously and putting metrics and buckled down. So this is going to be a fun little journey with you and see, you know, maybe I can actually make Mythic one, one year. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, that be, that's the goal, right? That's the goal. And uh, in, in case, you know, I didn't make it clear before, this is going to be uh, potentially, you know, maybe not exactly weekly, but bi-weekly. We're hoping this to be an episodic thing. Uh, and if if this is something that people like, if it's successful, uh, we're, we're really willing to do this for, you know, each set that comes out. All right, so let's get into a little bit more about this project. And uh, since this is our first episode, we want to really explain what we're trying to get out of this and what we're trying to do here, the process for the coaching process. Um, because this is a content piece for people, for people to really enjoy, uh, it's going to be a little bit different uh, than my normal one-on-one -on -one coaching process. And this is part of uh, Nathan's idea. And we're going to have uh, a, a scoring system, which I'm actually pretty excited about. For each draft, we're going to do a review of the draft, uh, a review of the, uh, the deck build, and a review of the gameplay. Right. And uh, for that, we have a scoring system. Nathan, you want to explain our scoring system a little bit? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned before, I, I enjoy golf. And so golf has like a handicap system, which is a way to uh, chart. It's a way for two different uh, skill set players to play against each other. But it also, as an individual, you can track your progress over time. And as you get better, your handicap becomes lower which means like the person you're playing against has to spot you less strokes, but that's an aside. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to put some thought into how to put metrics around how can we tank, like track how Nathan is doing uh, and uh, improving draft over draft over draft. And again, there's a lot of variance here, you know, cards you open, uh, you know, for gameplay and all that. But from the draft itself, like the actual, I picked this card and this card, uh, we've come up with a, a scoring approach to help uh, you basically score how Nathan did. <laughs> and so uh, I'll kick it back over to you to talk about the approach and then I can talk about the scoring. Yeah, so for uh, for each section, the draft, the build, and the, the gameplay, uh, we're doing it slightly different. So for the draft, uh, for each pick of the draft, we're uh, marking the picks as agree. So Alex agrees with the pick. Uh, di uh, disagree. So Alex says, mm, maybe, Nathan, maybe you shouldn't have done that one. Uh, but maybe it's not, you know, a... Uh, a, a huge mistake you know i think there's a distinction to make there our third one is that's a mistake nathan what are you doing bud <laughs> and so uh you know the agree is gonna be like thumbs up get full points for that the you know disagree but there's there's a line there i can see where you're coming from and then the mistake is you know no points for that and then we also have a fourth category of irrelevant picks um this is more a so it doesn't skew the data um where at the end of the pack where things just don't really matter uh maybe there's cards that are just irrelevant, not in your colors, not in the packs. So Those are just going to be subtracted from the final score, basically. Um, I don't get points for the basic land at the end of every pack. Well, yeah, maybe in Cal time. You never know. <laughs> you know? That's an exception. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's an exception. Um, and so what we can do from this is, of course, you know, as we progress over the weeks. And the, one of the cool things is you're going to get to see Nathan's progression. I think that that's one of the really cool things that is this being episodic. And we're going to be able to see... Uh, he is going to be able to show me week to week, maybe some, hopefully some very uh, data-driven improvement. And in, in terms of scoring, uh, basically, you know, you have 45 picks in each draft. We're going to try to remove all of the irrelevant picks. So you'll have 45 and let's say that end of packs one, two and three, there's six irrelevant packs, then I'm only going to be scored on 39 picks. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to share was a mistake score. 
So basically, how many blunders were there divided by the remaining number of relevant picks? So going back to the example, we had 39 relevant picks. If there were three mistakes, it'd be three over 39. Yeah, and, and drafting is is much more of an art than a science, right? And I'm not, we're, I'm I'm definitely not saying like, you know, uh, Nathan, you got a you got a 37 last week and a 36 this week. What happened? You know, it, it's it's going to be very much to just drive the conversation, very much to say like these are some driving points for some uh, places you can improve in the future. And the score is a nice benchmark, but it's not going to be by by any means, uh, you know, the 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 end all be all. It's really about starting the conversation about uh, how how improvement can start. Moving on to the the build score, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So this one's also pretty objective as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Got to build a forty card deck, so we want to say how many of those forty cards matches up. All right, let's say I draft a pile, mm -hmm. but it's still my pile. Of that pile, what, you know, how many of the forty cards that we go into a deck? match up to what, what Alex would build. And I think you're going to look at that from a couple, couple of different factors as well, right? Yeah, so we're, you know, when I think of, generally when you when you are uh, drafting, I think it's very good to be building as you're drafting, right? I think that's an important part of drafting. But of course, at the end of the draft, especially if your colors are particularly open, you're going to have some options in there, right? Um, and so the main three things that we want to look at are uh, Nathan's Curve, uh, Nathan's synergy, just how well do his cards play together in the abstract, and the mana base. I think mana base actually is one of the ones that gets overlooked, you know, especially if you're uh, just used to going, okay, real Arena told me to play these lands, uh, <laughs> you know, so I'll put those in. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think uh, a lot of people actually lose some, some EV percentage points there. So those are our three things we're going to be looking at. Um, and then from there, you know, we'll mark it that out of 40 and give you a, a rough A to, uh, a to F letter grade on, on your build as well. Yep. I mean, especially like you touched on mana base here in Kaldheim, I've been really struggling with, all right, I have mm -hmm. snow lands and this one counts for two. And oh yeah, I have this, uh, I think it's glittering frost that makes something a snow land and give it a different color. Yeah, yeah, that one's going to be, be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think we were also talking about um, giving a letter grade, you said? Yeah, so this is going to be, again, a little more rough. It's not going to be, there's nothing, no hard metrics or anything. Just a general idea to see, you know, what I think about, about your build, basically. Uh, and then we're going to get to the third one, which is the gameplay. Of course, gameplay is huge. Um, one of the great things about this being in video form as opposed to podcast or, you know, article is that gameplay is a lot easier to talk about. And especially just 1v1 or one-on-one -on -one here, me being able to talk to you about your logic, you being able to ask me questions about my logic about certain things. Um, it's very easy to see the gameplay right here, which is great. And this is probably going to be the most, uh, subjective, I would say. So all we're going to do here is talk about the, uh, the gameplay, maybe some spots that I would have done something differently, some things I'm thinking about. And then at the end, we'll give you again, that A to F letter grade, just to put a stamp on it basically. Yep. And I, I try to take notes as I'm playing to highlight, um, situations where I'm really unsure of the line or, um, you know, to specifically ask questions for you. This, I think, I think the gameplay is going to be the biggest value for showing coaching because you know, a lot of websites, like, a, a lot of a lot of the other stuff is discrete. I can ship you a draft, you know, a deck, a draft blog, and you can be like, oh, this, this, this. But exactly. Have the back and forth of like the context of the game, the flow, that kind of stuff. So I think this is going to be really neat. Yeah. Uh, should we jump in? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, what what we did here and what our process is is Nathan actually shipped me some videos of his drafts and his games, and we're gonna jump in and see what they look like. All right. So here we are in uh, the first draft. Just before we start, we wanted to just, uh, you know, transparency wise and for, for scoring wise, uh, Nathan did send me three drafts uh, this week and we're going to put the score for the third draft uh, at the end of the video. We're going to look through and go through two of the drafts and gameplays though, uh, just for the sake of time. And these are the ones that I picked the two that I think have the most teachable moments. Yeah. And just to give everybody a little bit of context here. This was not my first draft of the format. I had drafted a couple of times before this, and I think I'm in gold in this league, and which is where I think I am right now. Um, but the idea is this isn't the first time I've seen some of these cards. It, may, you know, it might be the first time I've seen a rare or something like that, but in general, I'm somewhat familiar with, with the, the format. So you're not, you know, coaching a complete noob at this point. Yes. Although you'll probably see some noob-like plays. Just to get, give some context too, um, how much content have you been consuming from this set? Because I, you know, one of the big uh, things that I always say to people is, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your homework. Basically, if you want to do well, you gotta do your homework. So just, just to give a little bit of uh, context there. So I have listened 
to a couple of podcasts that cover the cards and give them ratings mm -hmm. in terms of like what deck pairs are the best or anything like that i've actually intentionally stayed away from that just to not skew any results at this point cool uh, i wanted this to be the results of just pure coaching and then you know you're going to give me homework i assume and i'll go off and do that homework um, and i really haven't watched much streaming you know it's it is something i normally do and i, I really enjoy watching draft content but for the purposes of you know starting fresh here i i'm i'm pretty uh vanilla at this point cool so let's just get into this draft uh we won't give any spoilers of where you ended up here, but uh, just, uh, you know, your impressions. Do you remember this draft well and how, how it ended up, <laughs> your, your feelings towards it? Rocky, oh, yeah. solid. As you can see highlighted here, I'm, I'm, I'm reading and making sure I understood the cards. This draft was particularly rocky. I, I, I had an idea of what some of the stronger formats were or, you know, combinations were in my mind that mm. I'm not up against. Um, and so this was... Uh, my first foray down the specific avenue and it definitely felt like a big mess yeah so uh we're gonna you know I'll, we'll fast forward a little bit to where your pick was uh, i believe you took the narfi here uh you want to talk I about your did, thoughts yeah. about this pack and and your pick i i didn't think that search for glory seemed particularly strong you're mm -hmm. basically spending extra mana to go find another card and unless you have a a particularly strong card. I didn't feel like it was worth doing that. Good instincts. <laughs> uh, like at the time, I, I hadn't come across it yet uh, in gameplay, so I didn't think it would. You, I feel like you'd need a lot of instants and sorceries to make that effective. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt like a little all in at that point on that. Since then, I've gotten blown out by it once or twice. <laughs> I do think it's probably a pretty strong build around. Um, same thing with Elven Bow. I, I really wasn't that impressed with it. The few times I've seen it, but these artifacts on it with the body that come attached with them, they're kind of like the living weapon deal and mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty strong. But, um, you know, Narfi, if you can get the Snowlands and for him, him or her, him, yeah, I think it's King, right? So <laughs> him, keep coming back. Uh, it, he just seemed good. I mean, three Snowland to keep bringing back a repeatable four three seemed like the, the best one here. I mean, I don't like committing to gold this early, but um, I think if I had retrospect, I'd probably would have made the same pick here yeah I think. I think so so i agree with this pick i do think that elven bow actually is in contention i actually like that card quite a bit um it's it's a nice body just defensive body and you can really use the bow to start grinding in the mid game if you have a bunch of creatures one of the things that has has been clear uh, about the set that's come to light is just the equipment in this set are very good partially because of the reason that you said um, where it comes with the body, a lot of it does, and that's just like a huge upgrade on, a, on a, an equipment that doesn't. But also, uh, there's just a lot of smallish creatures running around, right? So if you can upgrade those at some point, uh, you know, this trades off, you put it on something else. Um, it's especially good with the, the rune cycle, right? Where you can like, if you give this, you know, give this lifelink or death touch too, that's really nice too. Um, so it is in the running. Uh, I do agree with Narfi. But maybe not as much as some people might think. Uh, I think Narfi is good, but I think people have him kind of in the, the busted tier. You know, um, what I found about the card is um, it is a good snow payoff. Um, but when, when I'm thinking about this card, it's very much, uh, this is a snow card, not really a blue-black card, right? It's like a, like a multicolor green card and I'm splashing it there. And it's a good card there, but that deck is full of good cards, right? So while this is certainly a, a nice one, I'm happy to start with it. Um, I wouldn't feel bad about moving off of it. There's also the Woodland Chasm here. Uh, it's worth you know worth talking about, but I'm a I'm, you know I'm not a huge fan of taking the the Snowlands early unless I have payoffs already. So take Narfi, happy with that. See where that goes. And oh, also right. kind of I'm interesting. In our yeah, first video ever. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things I'm also thinking is is where am I going to end up with this this card, right? And you know I kind of touched on it a little bit, but generally you know uh, a controlling. Uh, snow deck or one of the mid-rangey rampy snow decks. All right, moving on to this next pick here. What are your thoughts? Wow. Um, what I actually so this is a while ago. I don't remember what I ended up picking. Well, um, this is great. <laughs> Get the raw thoughts here. Yeah, the raw thoughts. So, um, being blue black and already snow, I mm -hmm. think if I was going to go back and look at this now, I would probably be looking at the the swamp the glittering frost or the yeti um however one of the things that i try not to do is get too attached to my first pick and kind of see what's coming uh -huh. so i see that there's two really good red aggressive cards here and okay now this is bringing back memory i was really torn already uh, what you're going to see throughout this deck this draft is i get past a lot of good red red aggro cards uh -huh. and 
uh, I really was debating the whole time whether I should jump ship or stay with what I had or shift over, and, and I was really torn. Um, I honestly don't remember what I picked in this draft, so... Um, well, let's see. Let's, let's see what you took. Let's forward and see what I picked. So you um, took... I believe you took the Fearless Liberator, if I remember correctly, and... Okay. Yeah, that is indeed what you went... Oh, look, you went Glittering Frost? Uh, uh, I no, I think I'm going to take the Fearless Liberator. So let's go back yeah, to that so pick for a second. Yeah, this go goes back to the, the, the what I was just talking about, which was, um, do I want to go with what's being passed to me, or do I want to try to stick with my first pick? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. So if Narfi... Let's have a hypothetical here, right? Let's say Narfi was Coma, right? The giant mythic snake that's basically unbeatable, the blue-green snake. Yeah. Does that change your, your pick the here? Coils, yeah. Um, it probably would change my strategy up th at least through pack one. Like, yeah. I would see what would come all the way through pack one. Or I would, least, yeah. You know, I agree with that. I think so too. And basically with a card like Narfi, which I was saying, I like the card. I don't love the card though. Um, Beers SC, who's a uh, you know, you'll if you if you're on Twitch uh, often, he'll frequent he frequents a lot of the the high level uh, draft streams. You know, uh, Ethan Ben Ham TV, and he's one of the the top trophy leaders on Magic Online. Loves the snow deck, and he thinks that Narfi is just one of the most overrated cards in that deck. So I think that uh, given that I have Narfi here. If this were a stronger payoff, in my, my pick one, I'd be like, let's lean into that. Let's keep going and take the Glittering Frost, or maybe the land, probably the Glittering Frost. But with it being a good card, not a great card, I like just taking the best card in the pack, which I believe is Fearless Separator. Obviously, there's our card door. You could take the gold card here, too. I'm not afraid of taking a gold card in this format, because there's a lot of playables, and some of the best cards just are gold cards. Um, but I do like, you know, when the pick is close, especially, where this is, you know, a comparable card to this, I like just taking the two drop here. So just to, to rewind what you said, you, Narfi is one of the overrated, or it's like, un, like it's important for that deck. I would say it's, I I the, I think the conversation around the card is it's pretty overrated right now. Oh, it's okay. a good card. So, uh, but not busted. Pick here would have been Fearless Liberator. <laughs> yeah, I like your pick. I agree. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was something better, like the Coma, uh, I would take the Glittering Frost because I'm like I want to stay on this path. But because this isn't a huge pull, I like taking the best card. Got it. Okay. All right, thoughts about this one? Um, let me remind myself of this pack. So again, I'm seeing good, what I think are good red removal spells. Like I think at this point, I think Squash was a good removal spell in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I like the Tuscary Firewalker because you get to draw a card basically if you you know attack and boast. Yep. Um, the Frenzied Raider. Uh, I had only had limited experience at this point. I, I think being able to boast and put a plus one, plus one counter on it's good, but I didn't, you know, it's kind of dependent on how many boast cards you end up with. But there was one in the last pack as well, mm -hmm. and I picked the boast card here. I was really drawn towards that. Um, if you're going to go with, you know, trying to stick to Narfi, there's probably the Priest, I think. I don't, again, I don't recall what I drafted, so this would be great. Yeah. Great. So we took, after thinking about a bit, reading. Oh, sorry, let's go back. I, I took the land. There you go. Yeah, we so took the land here. The things I just mentioned. <laughs> right. So, so I think I think that's a. Sorry, let's just dial back a little bit. I think that is a in the conversation basically. Um, in this pack, I believe the actual best card in a vacuum is squash. Um, squash started out for me as a. It looks like a clunky removal spell. You know, we've seen these before. Like five mana removal spell with like a little bit of upside, right? We don't generally love these cards. They're good, they're fine, but you know, you're not at a high premium. For me, mm -hmm. Squash crosses over that territory. You know, really surprised me where you just end up with enough giants and changelings in your deck enough of the time. That this is going to be a premium removal spell a lot of the time. Uh, even in your snow decks, like which we might be playing with Narfi, right? As Squash can be a good splash. And you, you're going to have your Mist Walkers, you know, the one four flyer. You're going to have your uh, Changeling is just the, I don't know, the two mana two two Changeling. So this card is going to be a two mana removal spell a lot of the time. And that's just fantastic, right? Um, that would have been my pick here with the Liberator and the Narfi in the pile, but because it goes in both decks, basically. Um, okay. And, you know, on top of that, it is just the best card in the pack, I believe. Um, a little bit of a wrinkle in this, which is kind of interesting, is that I think Firewalker is super strong. And because, like you noted, we saw another one of these in the pack previously. I think people don't take this card very highly because, like you said, it's kind of dependent on your deck. It could wheel. 
And this is the card, the Tusk Walker, the Scary Firewalker, that I think pairs best with Raider. Because the current of going Raider into Firewalker into Activate is really, really nice, right? Like the one mana to boast means this becomes big early without giving up any uh, early game. Uh, you know, you're not you're not like spending three mana like you would the Furious Liberator. You're spending just one and you grow it. All in all, I don't hate your pick of, of uh, Salt First Mire. So I'm going to give this a, uh, a disagree, but I don't think it's a mistake. Right, and tell, yeah, correct I me if I'm, I'm wrong. To go oh, good. Black Swamp uh, Snow Lane to go with Narfi. I think that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was just going to say, correct me if I'm wrong. The, pay, the idea here is take the, the snow card to go with Narfi. The one thing I would say about that is that, um, especially if I'm thinking about where Narfi wants to belong, where he goes and in, in, what deck he belongs in, that multicolor green deck eventually. Um, Sulphurus Mire is one of the lower priority lands, just because you don't end up with that many red and black cards. You'll end up with some, but it, it's not uh, blue and green adjacent, right? So I, I like your logic of like, you know, it's a black land for Nerfy. In the grand scheme of the deck I'm going to end up in, likely, I don't think Sulphurus Mire is going to be that important in the deck. So that would be my logic there. Okay. And again, <laughs> hovering, hovering on that priest. All right. Yeah. How about this okay, one? Okay, so... This one, I mean, to me, there was clearly no more aggro cards. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I mean, just looking at it, Fearless Pup hasn't really been like a big draw for me. I, I like the being able to boast them to attack, uh, but it just seems like such a mana sink every turn. Uh, so I was really looking, I believe in my head, I was looking at Way Down, because mm -hmm. like that feels like a, you know, honestly, a crappier version of Dead Weight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Inga Runeyes, I, I think. She, she he a, uh, yeah. seems strong in terms of it makes combat a little tricky um i like the idea of being able to scry three uh, it's still aligned with narfi um none of the other cards really were on par from my perspective yeah i think she's the most powerful card in a vacuum here uh and there's nothing in this pack that really pulls me in a like in a strong direction to stay with my early picks like i i actually do like pup in a percentage of my red aggro decks when i have the very cheap equipment like the the tormentor's helm like the the plus one plus mm -hmm. one equipment i think that card's actually pretty good with the pup uh, especially when you get a bunch of them but you know pup will pop probably wheel i also really like uh grizzled outrider kind of funny enough the 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 five five here it just looks like a stupid five five right but this card is really lined up well in the format um, where it's actually a real threat. Kind of one of the things I was uh, saying before is that things are pretty small in this format. And so when you just put a, play a 5-5 five, five on turn 5, that gets the job done a lot of the time. That being said, I do think Inga is a slightly better card here, and I like taking it. So, agree on this pick. All right. And and just, you know, to do a little bit of a check-in here um, for the viewers and for you as well, um, I think it's very much, you know... A lot of people are kind of worried at this point in the draft. It's like, what am I doing? Like, where am I going? Right, sometimes. Um, I think the answer, you know, I'll get, I'll get to a, a pick like this on stream a lot of times where it's like, I've got a red card, this gold card, a land, and people are like, what colors are we? And it's like, it doesn't matter that much. Like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> right, so um, I, I don't mind starting like this because one of the things I do like to do in a lot of my drafts is just take the most powerful cards, like the Liberator like we did, or, you know, even if they don't go together, and then we can draft that red deck and that snow deck. And then which one, whichever one we figure out is the most open, that's what we can move into. Here we get to a much less exciting pick. What do you, what do you think about this pack? Uh, I think I was trying to choose between Bind the Monster or Horizon Seeker. I mm -hmm. know we don't have any green yet, but green really does help the mana fixing. And I think I ended up with Horizon Seeker. I, Bind the Monster hasn't really been something I've, I've been that interested in. Yeah, it's a fun removal spell. Uh, let's see if you indeed, or, you know, you've, you've, you've had, you've had some fake outs so far where you've been like, oh, no, 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 no take that one. <laughs> oh. You're going to see that a lot through my video. I'm not so sure. So we do end up with the Horizon Scholar. I totally agree with that. Um, I think, yeah, that pack was really re weak. Horizon Scholar is the best card there. And you know what? Um, in, again, it's going to be actually pretty good with the Fearless Liberator or with the Narfi. Cause I do like, like kind of like a red green beatdown deck. Um, I think that's a reasonable deck in the format. Uh, is nice with the the boast plus one plus one counter creatures that might wheel so i'm keeping that in mind too um but also if we end up in the narfi you know snow sultai snow deck gonna be great there so i i 100 agree with that pick all right what about this one here so this one i think i was trying to choose between either the horizon seeker 
the Tuscary Firewalker or the Faceless Haven. I felt like the Faceless Haven with the snow already with Narfi, if I was going to push that way, it seems like a, a good lamb to have with that. Mm -hmm. um, I was struggling a little bit with the colorless mana that it uh, created. And then again, like I said, trying to think about, oh, aggro or not, uh, Horizon Seeker or not. So I believe I ended up on the Faceless Haven, but this one I was not really that sure on. Yeah, so this one I would say this is your first. Uh, I am gonna give, gonna give you a hard mistake on this one. <laughs> right, right. So, so Faceless Haven is. I see this as like a a constructed card that kind would make your will make your main deck like five percent of the time. Um, the cost of having a colorless land is pretty large, and it's it, that cost is actually amplified in the snow decks because you have. A hard time fitting enough mana sources to cast all your cards in in the first place you know you have red cards blue cards green cards you want to make sure you have enough sources and a colorless land doesn't help you on that front snow 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 can be pretty hard to activate so a lot of times it just kind of sits there um the the way the the place i would actually most like this card is a like a close to monocolor deck that just happened to pick up a bunch of snow lands. If you're like a red green aggro deck or something like that, red white aggro even, uh, even then it's a bit sketchy, right? Because you don't want to have like a colorless land in your aggro deck. But if you are close to one color and do happen to have that perfect storm of picking up the lands, that's where it would belong. Not so much in the multicolored deck. So I would say that in this pick, I would probably just land on the Firewalker uh, or the Horizon Seeker. I think either one of those is good. They're about comparable cards. Uh, I think Firewalker is a little bit better, but if you wanted to bias towards the Narfi, you could totally take the, the Horizon Seeker. Uh, I think that would be fine. Well, if we get, it didn't take us long to get to the first M. <laughs> you know, you did pretty well six, so far, though. Six, hey. six, six picks into episode one. Well, that's all right. Then. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to our next pick here. If so, I remember correctly, I think we're up for another M here. So what do you think about this so, pick? Uh, again, we're seeing another one of those frenzied raiders. I, at this point, I think in my mind, I had just moved off of, of red, red aggro. I, mm -hmm. mean, I think I was, I, in my mind, I didn't know that red green was an aggro deck in this format. Um, actually, until you just said that, I didn't know that that was a, a very viable uh, solution here. Um, so I think, I think I ended up on the snakeskin veil just because I was like, oh, we're going to be kind of base green. It's a good way to protect something. Um, and then none of the other cards seemed that great to me. So I was trying to choose between the Raider and, and the Snakeskin Veil. Yeah, yeah. So, so the you know, I said red green is an aggressive deck. I would caveat that with it can be an aggressive deck because it can also be a good home for snow, actually, um, with especially with Spella, like the green uh, red on common. That's great, too. In this pick here, I think there's a few options. Uh, I think... My first option would probably be Frenzied Raider. Uh, it doesn't go so well with the the, the Snow Wish cards that we have here, the Narfi, the Inga, kind of like the, the controlling cards, basically. But I think that there's nothing here that really does go well with those cards, right? Uh, Snakeskin Veil is generally not a card I'm wanting to play uh, unless I have a pr some pretty specific things. I am a, a snow deck with very few actual cards that will win me the game and I need to protect them. Or I'm like the Battlefield Raptor, put some auras on my creatures, protect them uh, kind of deck, right? I think Snakes can veil in a general mid-range, either like a mid-rangey aggressive deck or a mid-rangey snow deck, either one, I think just doesn't pull its weight. And I think this is uh, a good point, uh, a good pick to actually illustrate a point of when the pack is kind of medium, uh, take the card that has the potential to have the highest upside, right? Imagining in the deck this card will be good in, how good is this card? And I think two cards stick out to me as Battlefield Raptor and Frenzy Raptor, or uh, Frenzy Raider. In a good Battlefield Raptor aggro deck, red-white aggro, uh, you can, yeah, honestly, it can be like white X aggro. Um, Battlefield Raptor is just one of the most important cards. I was alluding before to equipment being good. Raptor's great with the equipment. Um, and so I think this is a card that does excite me. Now, when I look at the cards in our pile here, it's pretty far off from what we're doing. That's okay. I don't think that's a bad thing to take a card that's far off from what we're doing. But I might as well take a card that is similar in Frenzied Raider, where when this card gets there, it's quite good. And what would really push me over the edge to take the Frenzied Raider, I've already got Fearless Liberator, I've got Horizon Seeker, and we saw two Frenzied Raiders earlier that might even wheel, right? Yeah. So I think... This, uh, yeah, I, I will agree. I'll give you another M on this one, I think. <laughs> it's yeah. it's just crosses the border over to M. But, uh, you know, 
I, I think either of these would be reasonably strong here. Perfect. All right, and we're moving on to the latter half of the pack. What do you think about this one? We'll try to speed through these ones a little bit faster. Well, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes we made in these too, though. Um, <laughs> so I think I was just trying to hold on to the blue here. I was like, oh, buying the monster. I know I said I didn't like it that much earlier, but in my mind, you know, we were past aggro. Um, but I guess Ember Storm Raider would be, you know, a viable pick there. The kind of the, the rummaging is actually kind of decent. Mm -hmm. And I really, at this point in the format, I really wasn't sure on these black red lands. This one doesn't seem particularly great when you activate it. You know, three, three damage to a player and they discard a card. If, I feel like... I kind of want that to be three damage to a, a creature, but yeah, it would be very, very good if it was three damage to a creature. So yeah. let's see what you let's see what you went with uh, first before we get into this pack. Uh, you know, sure I went with the bind on this one. Yeah, I went to bind. So yeah. I would say, oh, sorry, okay, so just to talk about this uh, Imberstrom Skull Cairn, the actual effect on this card is pretty pretty good in the sense that like in the deck that wants it, which is like an aggressive red black deck. Just a land that can deal the last three points of damage is pretty powerful, right? Um, just having that hidden damage in your mana base is pretty nice. And the, the discard matters some some percentage of the time. Um, I would say that I'm not likely to take this card from our position, but also I think this is one of the worst ones because in the format, uh, black is pretty bad. So I just, as a drafter, am not going to find myself in black all that often unless, you know... I, I'm trying to bias away from black generally. So my myself as Alex as the drafter will not find myself there often. Some people might. Um, I actually quite like not build recluse, oddly enough. Looks like kind yeah. of a, a weird card, right? Just like, okay, here's a spider. We've seen these spiders a lot. But one of the nice things it does is, is kind of like the bear, the 5-5 five, five, uh, outrider. It is just nicely positioned in the format where it lines up nicely. It blocks the flyers. It can beat down in the early turns. Um, you know, it, it looks like it might trade down with like a two drop, but the nice thing is you can choose to not trade, right? <laughs> like you can just keep it up for, for not attacking and, and blocking, or you can, you know, attack on a, a later turn when it would trade for a better thing. Um, and so it's not a premium card by any means, but one of the things that's really important for mastering any draft format is understanding what the filler plus cards are, right? The cards that are like, nobody's going to want these early, but I'm happy to have this card in my deck. And Novel Recluse is actually right right uh right there for me and the thing that really pushes me over the edge to wanting it is it goes in your snow deck potentially and it goes in this red green beatdown deck that in, at least in my mind we might be building towards so i would be on the recluse here myself buying the monster this, fine but you know is this an m or is this a i'm gonna give this i'm gonna give this a a, a disagree I, I think bind is okay there i don't think that's an egregious pick by any means i would i would say i would uh i just you know fall on the other side of the fence basically yeah all right. So this is our our first pack again, mm -hmm. and I usually try to look to see what wield. And at this point, I think I was kind of kicking myself for not being like red white aggro because I I found those best gear shield mates to be pretty good. Also the story seeker with the lifelink. Uh, but you know, looking at what we have, we're pretty far away from that. So I think I just took the only card in the pack that made sense to me, which was the wither crown. Let's see. I've not been very impressed with the Brian Barrow intruder. So let's see what you took here. We took search for glory. A little, a little bit of a rare draft potentially. <laughs> oh, oh no, no, yeah, you did take, you did take the wither crown. You, you faked me out again. <laughs> did so I, did I actually? Get, I got the wither crown. Yeah, you got the wither crown. Yeah, you got the wither crown. Okay, so right. let's let's talk about that pick then. Um, a few things I would say here. So, sorry, let me just dial in here. I did totally look like I drafted. <laughs> I think it was thinking about just grabbing the rare draft. Maybe the I draft. think that'd be a reasonable pick. A reasonable pick there. So, basically. I think Wither Crown is close enough to unplayable that I'm I never want to put the card in my deck. There's you okay. know, it's it's like there you can kind of envision it as like very, very conditional and bad removal. It doesn't get a blocker out of the way. Um sometimes you put it you have to put it on like a boast creature and they still get value out of it when they attack with it. You know, there's 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 a few creatures in the set where like you put it on uh you know Spirit of the Aldegard is the one that I'd point out, the, the snow bear that gets bigger for all snow permanency control. Don't put it on that card. It doesn't do anything. It literally does nothing because it, it's oh, its power and toughness is set by the ability. The yeah, exactly. Um and so I think that yeah, the, the card is just if you just ignored this card from PAX you would improve your win rate, basically. Um, so the card that I am looking at here is a kind of bridging the gap, once again, between this red-green aggro deck and the snow-ish deck, and that's Seize the Spoils. 
Um, so it's kind of like a, a mid-level mid-level fixer if you're like two colors with a little bit of a splash, uh, but also filters out kind of like your expensive or exp expensive stuff in the early game. Filters lands in the late game. Again, not like a great card, but it fills a role in the snow decks. And I can also see it filling a role in the this red green beatdown deck too. One of the nice little combos is Horizon Seeker plus Seize the Spoils, right? Uh, just get a land with Horizon Seeker. Maybe you don't need the additional land. You pitch it to the Seize the Spoils, right? And so not a card that I'm like looking to include in my aggro deck, but again, this is the filler plus card in the pack for me in our position here. Um, I agree Intruder is not a fantastic card. You know, I think it's in the running. I think it's better than Wither Crown for what it's worth. Um, but yeah, I, I would just be on the Seize the Spoils here. Um, so I'll, I'll, because of how bad Wither Crown is, I'll give you a mistake on that one. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. That's good All right. And what do we think about this one? Um, I think we missed a pick there. Right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Good the, call. I good call. The, yes, you did. So the Frost, the, the Yeti came back and that, I don't know. It, I guess for what you're talking about earlier, it's somewhere between the Yeti and the Grizzled Outrider then, right? Yeah, I would say so too. I I think at Grizzle Outrider would be my pick. I just think it's a nice top end card, especially if I don't get the the Lindworms right, the the ravenous Lindworms, the six six the gains for. That's my ideal top end at common. Um, but this is a fine replacement too. I would take that here again, both in this like green beatdown deck we might have, but also the snow controlling deck. I think some people might be looking at Goldvein pick. That's a card that has gotten a lot of buzz uh, lately with. Uh, Death Sea, Streamer Death Sea being all, all about this card. And I do like the card because it's, it's a nice little way to generate some mana. Um, when, if you can get the first hit in for free, it basically says equip zero, right? Because you equip, you attack, you get zero. So, so it is kind of nice. I generally tend to correlate uh, Golden Pick with Flyers, though, or Evasion, so that you can guarantee those hits in. And we don't really have much of that. So I wouldn't take it here. Um, I don't think it's a good card just to fix, generally, is the way I would put it, um, if you can't reliably get it in. So I would go, like, Grizzled Outrider. But Frost Peak, Peak Yeti would probably be my, my second pick here. I think that Frost Peak Yeti is uh, an okay snow card. Definitely not one I'm excited about. Um, but, you know, you can play it in your snow deck if you need a card. And especially if, if this Grizzled Outrider isn't on your radar as a good card, I think this is a fine pick. So I'll give us a, a disagree, basically. Okay. And what? how are you feeling about the snow deck at this point right now? I mean, we've seen no snow <laughs> other than the one Meyer I took. That's a fantastic question. And I was going to note that on, on this wheel pack where there just, just hasn't been lands, oh, okay. right? Yeah. Fantastic question. At this point, I'm not really sold, right? I'm like, you know what? I have this Narfi, but who cares, right? If my lanes into the snow decks are basically, if I incidentally pick up some snow lands out of weave packs, and then maybe I pick up payoffs later, or I pick up the payoffs, a few good payoffs early, like the Spirit of the Guard, the Bear, uh, Avalanche Cutler, right? If I pick those colors up early, I'll really prioritize the lands. But sometimes even then, I get cut out. I don't get the lands, and if you don't get the lands, your deck can't function. So if I'm doing a little uh, check-in on my draft, and it's very important to do a check-in on your draft at this point in the uh, the the draft where you're like coming to the wheel, I would say, you know what? Probably not going to go down that path. So what's our next best path? And I think our next best path is either uh, a red green, a blue green, or a blue red deck. Uh, some some combination of, of blue green or red, right? Um, both because we have some decent cards in those colors, but also I think that for the most part, we haven't seen any good white cards. We haven't seen any good uh, black cards. And not to say that we've seen uh, a ton of good red cards or green cards or blue cards, but we've seen more. So if you're trying to figure out as a tiebreaker what to bias towards, I'd bias towards those colors. Got it. Yeah. What do we think about this pick here? Um, I mean, I had, as I said, we kind of written off the, the red aggro deck, but mm -hmm. the, the Firewalker I, I like. I wish I'd gone that route. So then I was choosing between bind and depart. I think I already had a bind, so I took the depart. Yeah, I would, I would. So I think Firewalker is not quite a premium card, but just a, uh, just a level below it where it's a very, very quality creature. And at this part of the pack, I think it's, you know, just like I was saying, with that little check-in you do with yourself, I think uh, if you were looking at your pile, and you can tell me what your, your thoughts were at this point, um, if you were thinking, hey, maybe I can be some sort of snow deck, uh, I think Depart is an okay pickup just because you can, like, you know, rebuy some sagas that you might pick up. And it's, it's, it's an okay flex card, basically. It's a flex spot. Never that important, but it's fine. Um, but I think if you recontextualize this draft is, hey, I don't think I'm going to be snow at this point. I think the pick becomes Firewalker a bit more clearly. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on where you were thinking. Well, I, 
I'm fairly certain I was still like, this is going to be a snow deck. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think, I think once again, it's, it's just super important to give yourself a little mental check-in. No, no, it doesn't even have to be at the end here. By this deck, which you probably would have taken the Outrider and uh, I took the Snow Covered Plains. Right, you're right. Snow Covered Plains is very low. My list of snow cards yeah. I want would be happy with the, with the bear. So yeah. I think we missed two ratings there. Those oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Thank a, you for... Was that a good for keeping me honest there? <laughs> so the depart was a uh, okay. I would give that a yeah. I think that's fine. Basically, given your given, path. Given, but or would you have gone with the? the I would have taken the firewalk. Yeah. So I'll give you. I'll give you right. a disagree on that. Basically, it's a D. Right? Yeah, it's a D. <laughs> and then this one's definitely a M or D, right? I would give this one a mistake. I think just like okay. uh, the mistake, at least from my perspective, I think it's a big enough mistake to to not have. Uh, and it's hard to give you a hard mistake here. Maybe I'll give you a disagree because there's a bit of uh, information that you might not have known, but it's hard to recontextualize this point if you're not thinking about, should I be recontextualizing my picks and what lane I should be in? But also like, if you're not seeing Outrider as a real card, then of course you're gonna just take the land because it's a snow land, right? So well, we I'll, gotta go with what you know now, though. So this yeah, is yeah. I, I was gonna, I was gonna say, do you, you want to plead your case, or should you? Yeah, are you yeah, just gonna no, accept? I'll yeah, okay. I'll, 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 uh, I'll give you the M and try harder next time. How about that? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. So we move on from that, and I think the the next few picks are well. We'll see. There I might be some relevant things relevant. in there. We get a. This one's fairly irrelevant, especially if you're playing best of one, right? Sideboard yeah, cards here. Sure. But the tire firewalker wheels and that right there. Oh, so yeah, obviously that's a great right the it's a good too. pick. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was just gonna note that. That's that's a great uh, that's a great observation from you, where it's like And if you notice I yanked the other red card to the side. Yeah, oh, yeah. Not red aggro. So so you're you're like and, and this is I think where a lot of people falter too, where they're just they tunnel vision themselves on this I am this. Right? When it's uh it's unless I have a very strong start of like, oh, these cards are just coming to me. You know, I, I started with a blue red giant deck where I picked Agar and Squash and Mistwalker. I'm just like, oh man, I got all the stuff here. Then I can say, all right, I'm probably blue red giants. But in your start here, where it's like, I got some cards, none of them are fantastic, but they're not awful. I'm very open to being like, let me just, you know, this is the position where quote unquote drafting the hard way comes in the most where you don't have a fantastic start. You have some fine cards, but I think the most successful lane from your position is picking up what the rest of the table is putting down, basically. And and it's uh yeah, if you if you tunnel vision pigeonhole yourself into I I am this deck, you put the good cards in the sideboard <laughs> that, that are coming around. Alright, and ooh, look at this. We open up a nice little planeswalker. So what are your thoughts here? So I have no white. Mm -hmm. But Nico seemed very strong. Glimpse of the Cosmos. I I like the card, but I wasn't sure that I was going to have any giants. Mm -hmm. And I really, to be quote, quote, to be transparent, since this was, you know, the first of these types of drafts, I wasn't really thinking about shapeshifters at that point. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, well, I'm nowhere near Glimpse, and Nico seems really strong. If I can get the splash in, or you know, try to get some white in there for it. I have the Horizon Seeker. I, I don't know. Um, I honestly don't think I looked too much at any of the other cards. It was basically between those two. I may have hovered over one or two here just to fool you, but I think it was between those two. Yeah, I think I think I remember this one. Uh, I think you ended up taking the the Nico, and I think that's reasonable, especially in your in your idea of what you are right now, um, wh what lane you're in. Nico's a fine card in your snow deck as a splash, and hey. Maybe with the Horizon Seeker and that Snow Plains you picked up, it's actually going to be a, an easy card to, to play in your deck, right? Um, I think that pick one, pack one, I would probably just take... It's very close, I think, between Nico and Glimpse the Cosmos. But Glimpse the Cosmos is very, very good. It's deceptively good, I think. Um, just the rate on this card, digging six deep uh, for for three mana is, is really, really great. Um, I, I think, you know, if this was like day two of a GP, I would probably take the Glimpse of the Cosmos, but uh, I think that Nico is a fine pick here for sure. They're very close, and I guess in your position, like you were saying, if you aren't thinking, oh, about shapeshifters, I can definitely see how you might think, oh, well, I'm not going to have that many giants potentially. So um, I'm going to give you a... I agree with this pick, actually. I think, I think oh, it's yeah. very close, basically, and you can go either way. So pick up that Nico. Pretty happy about it. Uh, and we move on to our... 
Next pick here, as <laughs> we age for the person beside us to pass. All right, and we get to this pick. What do you think about it? Um, let's see here. I have the behold. Mm -hmm. oh, I think I, and I think looks I like we picked it. Behold. Yeah. Uh, I think I was hovering between that and the glacial floodplain to mm -hmm. support the splash. Mm -hmm. Um, again, looking at that red aggro deck, there's Arnie up there, but yeah, say la vie. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think if we just go back to what I was highlighting between, it was that and the, the Glacial Floodplain. I think that's what I was toggling between. Yeah, and, and especially, you know, we mentioned this before, but especially this part in the draft where our paths, you know, my path and your path uh, of what we would have done is going to diverge a bit. But you can definitely look under the lens of what is best for your deck currently right now, right? So like you said, say be on that Arnie, that would have been nice for our potential red aggro deck. But we'll, we'll see what is best for our, you know, snow controlling deck. And... One of the things too that I think it's interesting to think about for these multicolored green decks or uh, snow decks is they don't have to be snow decks necessarily. You've got the Narfi, right? But you can just play blue green with you know a decent curve and maybe pick up some splashing here and there. It doesn't necessarily have to be a snow deck. It's nice to incidentally pick up the Snowlands, um, but I think in your pile without. Uh, a ton of snow incentives. You know, you've got the Narfi, but I don't know how likely it is we play that here. You've got the Yeti, which isn't a huge incentive. I do just like taking the Behold the Multiverse as a singular, uh, very powerful card, right? I think that the the Floodplain would be my pick if, say, you had, you know, an Avalanche color or one of the better snow cards in your pile, but I like taking the card that doesn't rely on you picking up snow payoffs later. So, agree on that pick. Great. All right, and we get to this one. So let's see here. The snow covered island I was looking at, I I had not played with or against the reflections at this point when mm -hmm. I did this draft. Uh, again, going back to I wasn't thinking about shapeshifters. So mm -hmm. to my mind, I was like, well, that seems very you know pigeonholed and niche. Um, but since I was still thinking snow in my head, just by having zero, like two crappy snowlands. Um, I think I was looking at also the Boreal Outrider, and I think that's ended up where I landed. So I think the three cards I would consider is Island, if I was going to redo it now, Island, Reflections, or um, Outrider. Yeah, so so I think, I think that... you can see me checking my <laughs> Yeah, counting right. your creature time, sorry. <laughs> Basically, okay. so I think that, and you know, it looks like you took the Outrider here. Basically, I think that Reflections is a cool build around, and I think it actually is legitimately good, but it just takes a lot for the deck to to get there. I want like 10 or 10 to 13, 10 to 12 creatures of the same type before I put this card in my deck. Obviously shapeshifters really help, right? Cuz then those just, you know, they're your uh your your free your free bingo space basically, right? Um but I I need that threshold for it to be a good card. Uh and I think that I am agree in agreement that those are the the, the picks here, Outrider, Bergstrider and Snow Island. I would actually probably take the Bergstrider myself. Um, I oh, think okay. that- I didn't mention that one, so. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Bergstrider is in the conversation, you know, if you listen to uh, anybody out there, listen to the most epi recent episode of Limited Resources at the time of this recording anyways, um, uh, Luis was uh, uh, alluding to a conversation me and him had on Twitter about what the best uh, blue common was in the set, right? Whether it's uh, Behold the Multiverse or Bergstrider, right? And I landed on Bergstrider, he landed on Behold, but we both basically said, you know what? It's pretty darn close and you couldn't, you can't go wrong either way. So I value Bergstrider really, really highly. I think it's just a little bit better than Boreal Outrider. Like I think that Boreal Outrider is a nice card to have, um, but it's kind of like, all right, this is a cool uh, little reward for being in the snow deck where Bergstrider is like, this is a reason for me to want to pick up more snow lands. And I think I would take that here. Uh, it just okay. comes down, if you're on the beatdown, it makes it really hard for the opponent to uh, to stabilize, and it stabilizes you really well if you are if you are uh, on the back foot a little bit. So that's what I would take here. I think Boreal Outrider is a perfectly fine card, though, so I'll give you a disagree on this one. All right. What a surprise. You landed on the aggro card, and he and Luis landed on the card draw card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Shocking. Shocking. How, how bizarre. All right. We move on here. Uh, okay, so this one I was still trying to think if I was in the snow deck or not. Despite having no snow lands, I don't know why I would think that. <laughs> um, so I think I was trying to choose between the priest, which you need certain snow permits for, uh -huh. the sculptor, which you also need snow lands <laughs> for, or the actual snow land. And I don't think I took the snow land. I think this was a, a, a sculptor of winter, so probably an M. 
Oh, I think this is a fake out. Just oh, okay, let's see. <laughs> so, so let's let's if I trust you and you did take the sculpture of Winter, um, I would say that after taking the Boreal Outrider, uh, I would I would not count this as a full mistake. I think this is more a disagreement, right? I think okay. basically, I think I would definitely take the Fjord here because I think you know, you, like you said, you need lands for the sculpture to be good. You have a, a snow payoff or two. You don't really have many good snow lands, right? None of the ones really that are in color. And especially the way our pack one went, I don't think we're, the, the table is valuing the snow lands pretty highly, right? So I'm not expecting them to get the, I'm not expecting to get them in pack three. This is our time to pick them up if we want them and we do want them, right? Um, the argument for taking Sculptor here is maybe you're a little bit worried about making just like playables at this point. I, I don't think you would be. Yeah, it was a, yeah. It was a too, too bare in my mind. Right. What are your thoughts on Inga, though? Like, the Inga's in this pack. Yeah, I, I would consider her, yeah, especially when your curve is a little bit, not not wonky, but it's a little bit high. You got some fours in there. I wouldn't consider her, her uh, a consideration here. I think it's between the Sculptor, the Fjord. If you had some red fixing, I think Squash is in the, consider in the conversation as well. I think Fjord's pretty important with the snow cards you already have, and it lets you pick up more snow cards later and maybe even enables a splash. So I would take the Fjord here, so, but I, I don't think this is terrible. Real quick on the squash. Though. Of course. So we have the Horizon Seeker and we have the Mire. Mm -hmm. We just need to grab another red source to splash it, right? Yeah, I guess my my uh, my bar for splashing the card is also that I also pick up some giants or shapeshifters right. so that it is... So you don't want to pay the five. I don't, don't want to pay the five right? very often. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a nice backup plan, but... I would really like to put that card in my deck. Look, if I had a bunch of giants or shapeshifters already, I think that might even uh, be the pick between that and the land. I'd still land on the land there. But um, I do think it's really close to that point. Well, one thing to note so far is I don't think we've seen a lot of red aggro cards, which makes sense because we passed so many of them that mm -hmm. they would be cut. Uh, speaking of which, there's the Frenzied Raider here. But, yeah. Um, I think the three for me were Inga struggle for skimfar or snow covered swamp and i think i landed on inga just because she was the uncommon yeah it's the <laughs> it's the yeah, uh I probably should have taken that it's the bias of ooh, that one's silver and these ones are black right <laughs> yeah so so i think inga is a fine card um you know just kind of like i was mentioning before she's she's good she's a quality creature um at this point in the draft i'm looking at what am i missing right what, what am i what are the roles i need to fill in my deck and you know, I sure would like some quality creatures. I don't have a ton of them right now. But I think a little more important is a few good interaction spells. And, you know, we've got the Bind, we've got to Depart the Realms, which is okay. But, you know, nothing really that just, you know, what I would count as a quality interaction spell. And so if I'm looking at what role do I need to fill more here, I think quality interaction spell is, uh, is a little more important here. So... I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna make the same mistake on this one, just because I think this is a, a fundamental issue with with where the draft is going, basically, where your deck is gonna end up, right? I think sure. we do miss this this struggle for Scamfar. All right, we we'll move on here. And what Speaking about this one? Interaction. You gotta provoke the trolls, which I don't take. I think I, you know, the picks on Horizon Seeker, and I think that's where I stayed. Nothing else really was like mm -hmm. jumping out to me. Yeah, just build up that quality creature base. Totally, totally agree with that one. Nothing, nothing too much to talk about in that pick there. I mean, there's the there's the red cards, but you know, provoke is not a card that I'm like super excited to splash. It's just a little bit below rate, um, so yeah. And we get you know, we know where we land up on this one. <laughs> yeah, you get an Narfi. That's the Narfi. So it's kind of interesting, right? Because I think that if I take Narfi here, I've really got to prioritize some some amount of fixing now, right? Because now like we're base blue green. I think it's safe to say we're base blue green, and we're like. Trying to play this Nico, trying to play these two Narfis. You know, the Narfis are going to be good in our deck because we have a few snow uh, snow creatures. So even if we can't bring it back consistently, it's going to pump those snow creatures, right? Which is nice. Um, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself in this spot, wow, if I really want this deck to come together, geez, do I have to really, really focus and, and take fixing pretty highly. Um, so I agree with this pick. I don't think you take Snow Mountain here. It doesn't have much value to you. Um, but yeah, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit nervous about that pick still. <laughs> well, I think if you rewind it right before that pick, I was questioning my snow cause I was looking mm. at my, I was looking at the, yeah, there we go. like, oh, should they go? Um, so g giving what you said, you know, I think I was choosing between Skimfar or Rhinewood Falls and I was like, oh, I just got this Narfi. I got to be able to do it. I'm able to, you know, bring him back. So I, I landed on the Rhinewood Falls here. Yeah. 
Agree. That's a great pickup for you. All right, and we move on. The next one, I think, uh, was the wheel. Oh, look well, at that. What a, what a gift. Yeah. <laughs> what a gift. Despite, despite having no giants, I, I snagged that. Yeah, that's 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 a great sign for you. I mean, I think you can probably pick up some in the, in the third pack, hopefully, anyways. I'm not so, taking anything else here. <laughs> and then speaking of giants, I think I grabbed the masked vandal, seeing that it was a shapeshifter. Which is also a really nice pickup for you for a lot of reasons. It's a cheap creature. That's cheap. Yeah, like you said, it's a shapeshifter. It's a card I just wanted in my deck. And I believe we, if I remember, we end up on the reflections I, I, here. Yeah, I, I don't know that I ended up running it. I don't think I ran it. I don't think I had the cards for it, but I didn't see anything else in that pack that you'd even consider. Yeah. Would you consider something else there? I don't think so. I mean, I think if you wanted to be really conservative, you could take the intruder. Because um, now that you have some creatures with stats and especially some creatures with boast abilities, like the two... You know, the two Horizon Seekers. This card plays reasonably well with, with Horizon Seeker because, you know, they go to block, you blow out the block, make the thing smaller. Like, the basically the way I'm thinking about this card, the Intruder, is it's a combat trick on, on a body rather than a body with a yeah. combat trick, right? So if I um if I want to get my boast creatures in, my green boast creatures, that's something I can do. I think I would also just take the reflections on the off chance that we open up, like, you know, we, we pick eight shapeshifters in the next pack or something. I don't think we're going to miss this intruder. I do like King Harold's Revenge in, like, that, uh, you know, there are like a green white beatdown deck or that red, red green beatdown deck I was talking about, but certainly not the, uh, not the deck for us. I, I would note that. I never even considered that card. It's quite good, actually. It, it plays out mm -hmm. as, like, yeah, it plays out like if you have a lot of creatures, high creature count, especially if you're going wide. Uh, you know maybe some some token generation kind of plays out as like deal you a chunk of damage kill your worst card right which is just a good card in your aggressive deck yeah, basically every, yeah but it's not all creatures must block it's though. not it's just got to be blocked by one it's not but it, it ends up being uh playing out in a way where it's like yeah probably have to throw some things in front of this 8-8 basically <laughs> or else you're just sure. gonna die right is the way it, it uh it often plays out um so yeah um, worth noting too, just just uh, you know, taking another look in in. Uh, ooh, that's a nice pickup. The Fjord Wheel is great. Yeah, I definitely uh, grab. That. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think these are a little bit irrelevant here, so we'll, we'll categorize. This is relevant. I think it yeah, went to the straight to the I categorize that as relevant. As now we're rounding out the second pack here, and we've kind of got you know I, the the first draft or so the first pack we were saying to ourselves. Okay, let's uh, take note, take kind of stock of what we're doing. I think this is pretty relevant too. Um, yeah. take stock of what our deck could be, where we're trending towards, where we can see ourselves ending up, and, and and that's the important thing at the end of pack one, basically. At the end of pack two, I'm often thinking, I have a deck. I hope I have a deck anyways. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are the things, what are the what are the holes I need to fill in my deck? What roles have I not filled in the in the uh, previous packs, basically? You know, I was talking about the removal interaction being one of those roles i think we'd need to we'd like to pick up some more interaction um quality creatures they have decent quality creatures um but i think the two things i'm looking for are that interaction and a little bit more fixing so those would be my my prime things going into pack three here that i'd, I'd really prioritize highly okay and, and another all to top things off which yeah. is irrelevant all right what do we have here all right um so we have the snow-covered island. Mm -hmm. We have the... I don't even know how to say that. Mora? Mora? Yeah. yeah, the two T's always throws me off. <laughs> how, do, well, how do you... What do you call that one? Morit? I think it's just Mor Morit. I don't know. I, don't, I, 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 I call it Morit. <laughs> All right, we'll go with Morit. Across, yeah. And then... Morty. I wasn't actually really sure of this uh, Path to the World Tree. I've, I've never ran it, never played it, but, you know, two mana fixing for it. I, in my mind, that, that bottom line was never going to come into play, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, what is it? Gain two life, draw two, they lose two, and you make a 2-2 two -two or something like that. Oh, for not having played it, you know it pretty well. <laughs> well I've got a little, little yeah, cheat sheet. Little cheat like, yeah. And it's too small in the screen to read. Oh, so fair I enough, yeah. I could, could know what it did. Um, um, and then the glitter of frost, glittering of frost. Mm -hmm. I think I landed on the Marita frost, though. Yeah, that would be my pick too. Uh, so path is a really good card. It's a really, really nice card if you have the potential to play the five colors, right? I would say that you know I, I wouldn't play the card if I couldn't activate it. Um, two mana to go to get a land is just not a good rate for for your fixing. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can activate it, it's a really, really good card. Uh, I wouldn't consider it here 
because I think that you know, we're a bit too lacking in the fixing. And I think that, you know, the Mora here is really nice. It's not, uh, you know, a super premium card, but it's really good. Just even just making a 5-5 five, five Frosty Eddie or whatever, right? Oh, like, yeah, everybody. See, I didn't know the card. I had to bring it up and read it. <laughs> yeah, what else do you... What, what are these uh, 200 words on this card say? Um, yeah, even even making a Frost Peak Yeti is pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, I agree with this, just as filling in that quality creature slot. Again, we have quality creatures, um, and Run Ashore is an, is an interesting card here for interaction, because I do actually like this card, but I feel like we can probably wheel it. So I'll, I'll give you a big ol' agree on that one. And moving on here. Um... Frost, snow covered forest, or the frost auger in my mind, and I, I think I, I ended up on the frost auger. You know, being able to draw a card every now and then is good, and just you know, getting a body down early. I think I was trying to check right there <laughs> what, <laughs> what my 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 snow count was. There you go. Now you see me going through it and counting it. Mm -hmm. It's three, four, five, six, and then the four lands. I think I'm at ten, something like that already. Mm -hmm. So generally, I would take the Snowland here. Um, I think it's okay. just, yeah, I think it's just a little bit too important uh, for the cards that you have that care about snow. Mind you, you don't have a ton, but I think you have enough that you want to care about it here. Um, and Frost Auger is a card that in your very heavy snow decks, you can run it. Like in your like 2021 snow card decks, right? Where a lot of your lands are snow, a lot of your spells are snow. Um, but if it's not drawing a card every other turn, it generally doesn't pull its weight. Right, and I don't think we're at the point where we we can run the card right now. So I think the combination of this, the the forest being really important and the frost auger just not being a great card here would make me just want to take the forest. Is that a D or an M? Sounds like an M. I'll give you an M. Yeah, <laughs> give you an M on that one. All right, what do we um, think about this pick? So Alpine Meadow, you know, didn't really seem that great to me. I think I ended up on Replicating Ring. It's a snow permanent that goes with the Frost Auger, and it does mana fixing. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's, it's perfect. It's, it's everything we want here, right? It's a little bit of ramp. It's a little bit of fixing. Uh, fixes for our, our Splash of Black, Splash of White, whatever we, we might choose to end up in the final build. And, yep, yeah, totally buy that. All right, and we move on to uh, this pick here. Pick another Snowland, yeah, it might look like. Snowland, yeah. I don't I don't think there was anything else that really was as important to me in that one. So uh the port maybe, I guess. Yeah, I tend not to play these unless I'm like like I, I tend to think these are less like five color cards. They can be if you have a lot of fixing, but I tend to only play these in like the the decks where I have base blue black or base blue white for this, right? So I'd I'd happily play the base blue green one. Um, but unless I had a lot of fixing, which I don't think you're quite at that level, I wouldn't pick up these because they're just like tapped lands in your deck, which, which you know, tapped land is a is a big cost, even if they do have some bonus in the late game sometimes. Um, so Sinkhole is interesting. It doesn't really fix you, right? It, it is a snow land for the cards that care about that, but it's going to be like tapped swamp in your deck <laughs> a lot of the time or, right or tamped pl planes for nico right? yeah or yeah so it does fix you on those if you play both of them right um so if it fixes you a little bit i think all in all i would probably just take this Jaspira sentinel here um i think that it does a better job of fixing you mm -hmm. while just being you know we've seen cards like this before uh and this yeah. is it good in this format it's actually creature? reasonable like if you have a high creature count which you're you have a pretty high creature count currently i think um and you have early creatures and you want to splash like it's a lot of things that have to add up to, to make me want to play the card but if you do have all those things it's a reasonable card and especially because we are heavily prioritizing the fixing and i think you know this the, the little thing that points me in the direction is this this is fixes slightly better than this card you do want sure. the card if all those things line up basically um the the difference between this card uh and cards like that we've seen in the past is that the one two reach body is actually kind of relevant. Like, it, it can team up on a double block later in the game. Uh, sometimes, not in this deck, but sometimes the elf actually matters. So, I'd probably take that here. I think it's a bit of a, a disagreement, though. I think this is a, a fine pick, right? Sure. All right, moving on here. To... I'm gonna listen to your advice on this one. I think we ended up on the... Uh, let's see here. We're on pick... I think you missed a pick there. Oh, sorry. Yep. There we go. Yeah, we grabbed the Berg Strike. Yeah, that's up. Nothing else in that. Fantastic that pick. In consideration. Fantastic pick. Love it. And we move on to this one, pick six. 
I was torn. I, I between getting the snow land. I wasn't sure on this one three death touch guy, uh -huh. Finn the Fang Bearer, or the Boreal Outrider. I landed on the the Outrider, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Let's look at your your curve a little bit here. Your curve of creatures is currently you got two two drops, uh, two That's early it. creatures, right? And I, I have a one drop. Yeah, and a one drop, and the one drop yeah. I would say doesn't quite. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to block, block, right? Like, like yeah, that, like I'm hoping it to attack and block. And so I think given that, and given you do have, you know, pretty good late game, this card I think helps you get to the late game a little bit better than this. We actually have a ton of uh, threes and fours. Maybe not a ton, but enough threes and fours, and you really can't go wrong with taking the two drop, right? Like a quality true drop. When in doubt, take the two over the three, generally. Um, so yeah, I, I would say Finn here. Boreal Outrider is fine, so I, I would say that this is a... Mm, I, I, I want to be strict here and say a mistake, just because okay. I think I think in this point in the draft, it's critical enough that we fill in those holes. I think pick one, pack one, if you looked at these two cards, you take Boreal Outrider, but I think it's critical enough that we have enough early game to to take the fin here okay oh uh, yeah i think in this point i was just snow with frost Dogger is what i was thinking yeah totally totally but to your point it's not it doesn't make sense to build around um you know a one drop um so i i don't know that i was even considering struggle but now that we've had this session you know i'm low on interaction i probably should consider that but mm -hmm. i landed on the floodplain yeah I, I think that's reasonable this would be a, i agree with your take here that I'd probably take the struggle. But I'd, I'd say this is a, a disagree, not a mistake. Because I do think that it is really reasonable to want to pick up another Snowland, especially one that helps you fix for Nico, right? So while we are a little bit low on interaction, uh, we have a few things, which isn't terrible. Nico, we, you know, kind of funny. Nico is also interaction. So this Glacial Floodplain, in a way, helps us play interaction, <laughs> right? So yeah. that's, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, so yeah, this would be a disagree for me. Uh, I think I would... Tended to take the uh, the 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 fight spell, but I can totally buy the floodplain. And we did take the floodplain. Yeah, moving on to the latter half of the pick here or the pack here. I think we're get gearing up for a, a. I'm actually interested to see what you say here. So I wasn't sure that I was going to play black for Narfi because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure on the double splash, and I ended up taking this blue green because it was returning to snow and I was like, well, I'm going to have snow in the graveyard. Um, so I ended up taking the first three seasons over the, uh, the Narfi. And I was also looking at the Mistwalker, but mm -hmm. I wasn't too sure. I would say I'd be on option C here myself. <laughs> I think that, Mistwalker? yeah, I take the Mistwalker. So I think that three seasons like Frost Augur is a card that you really need a lot of snow to play. Um, if you have a lot of snow, it's a reasonable card. It's not even that good, but it's reasonable. It, it's it's good, you know, filler plus, I would say. But you need to have 20 plus snow cards, basically, including your lands. Um, I think the third Narfi, just by merit of being a legend and a five drop, makes me say, probably don't want the third one. And Mistwalker, you can't go wrong taking Mistwalker. I mean, you can, I, you know, to, it's, it's a little bit of hyperbole to say you can't go wrong, but it's sure. just such a solid creature. Uh, it also works well with our, our Glimpse the Cosmos, right? It's not a shapeshifter, which again, you weren't uh, thinking about at the time, like you were saying, but especially wanting an early game blocker, also a nice way to close up the game. Also a zombie for Narfi. That's another thing too, right? So all oh, those yeah, things yeah, together, yeah. yeah, all those things together would make me want to take Miss Walker here. So right. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a that mistake one. on that one. A what? An M? Or yeah, give, give me an M. <laughs> all right. I, um, this was a pretty easy Glittering Frost for me. Um, snow fixes the mana. Yeah, so this is actually pretty interesting. I'm gonna give you a disagree on this one. I, I okay. agree that you like you. So we were saying, look, we need the fixing this pack. I think we actually picked up not quite like we're not drowning in it by any means, but I think we do really want a second or third interaction spell here. And run ashore is actually a card that um. I, I want in basically every one of my blue decks. Um, it's just, it's a lot better than these cards have been in the past. Instant is, is a big part of that. Um, putting one of the cards on top is a big part of that. So generally what happens is, you know, both players are building out their boards, uh, either in an aggressive matchup or in a controlling matchup, you know, a similar snow matchup. And if you can go like bounce your four drop, bounce your five drop, attack, and then you don't have anything to attack back with, this card's quite good. So just the fact that I want, you know, uh, 
one of these in all my blue decks, basically. I'm a little bit low on interaction, and I think we, we picked up enough fixing at this point. I think I would just take the run ashore here. How sad are you to see a ninth pick, third pack? Showdown of I know, time. right? I was gonna, I was gonna say uh, yeah, that's that that aggro deck that could have been. Although to be fair, I don't think it would have been red, red, white. I think red, green probably would have been. Red, green. Yeah, yeah, but but even still, that's uh, it's a little sad to see that there. All right, and so we're I, yeah, go ahead. I just grabbed whatever. Nothing here seemed relevant. Yeah, I don't think I don't think anything is super relevant here. I will say, like, not for this this particular uh, draft, but I found that Roots of Wisdom. Which is not a card I'm often playing, but if I end up with enough shapeshifters and especially like a high value elf or shapeshifter, like the you know there's the there's the two drop rare the War Master, which is just really really good, um the the elf rare. So if I have like a, a density of good shapeshifters slash elves and cards I want to buy back that will die because they're good, <laughs> um this is like a fine flex slot card where it's like yeah you can play it and uh, you know it's not terrible. Uh, so I'll give you a, a relevant for that one, basically. Uh, yeah, I think we, yeah, we're on yeah the, sorry, I skipped around a little bit there. Um, moving on. I think we're getting another M here. So I thought that this was irrelevant, so I grabbed the spec. Gotcha, yeah. Ago. It doesn't matter. In retrospect, um, I probably at this point would have considered the Raiders card mm -hmm. personally but before today, but now it sounds like you would have landed on the Outrider. Yeah, I, I think so. And you know what? I might, you know, we'll get into this in the build at this point, but if I had three Grizzled Outriders, I might add even, and, and not a ton of snow, like you don't have like a ton of snow, you have a decent amount of snow. I might just consider playing a, a, a cleaner mana base with just blue green and playing the Nico as my, as my one splash. You know, not, sure. not sure I would, but that's a consideration. And that's, that's a nice thing of just taking a, you know, a mono green five drop there. Um, mm. This one, I ended up in the Eddie. I was yeah, I, I think, her. yeah, that's, I agree with that. I don't like taking the land. This one's irrelevant. Uh, you know, you could play okay, Broken Ring, so that's nice. And that's, that's, yeah. Okay, so that's the end of the draft. Um, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit. What, what did you think about, you know, some, some thoughts and takeaways where I diverge from your thoughts, maybe some things that, uh, you know, you were surprised at potentially? I, I think the 5-5 five, five vanilla mm -hmm. definitely surprises me. That was good to know. Um, I think my inexperience with the format and not knowing the usefulness of some of the cards shit, like was um, visible there. Like right. looking at the three seasons, for example, or thinking that uh, not really knowing what a proper snow deck looked like. Uh, I think it came through and, and my inexperience with the format really uh, it was easy to see there. Um, yeah. And then also uh, your terms of you know keeping flexibility, keeping open, um, I probably could have had a really good red deck if I had stuck to that, or red-green deck. I think the blue I have is probably subpar. Yeah, those are my big takeaways, too. And and that's the great part. Like, I think the biggest level up you can have from having somebody else look over your shoulder is just like, oh, I wasn't even considering that card here, right? Like, those are the yeah. big ones where it's like, once you are, you know, once some light is shed on those cards the things that you were once blind to in the pack stick out and you're really going to start to see more paths. So I'm glad that that was something that, that we touched on too. And again, I, yeah, I think I agree with you. The second biggest thing was just, you know, not, uh, not mentally pigeonholing yourself, tunnel, tunneling through I am snow at the end of pack one. Those, those are the two big takeaways for me. All right. So let's, uh, let's tally up your score here. So you're, uh, my, my stream viewers will know that, uh, I'm not known for my, uh, prowess in math so you're you're going to be doing our calculations here nathan what did you uh calculate your score as for uh this, this first draft here sure so you're you're a math is for blockers kind of yeah <laughs> exactly exactly all right so hopefully this is the low bar i don't know that it could go much lower than this <laughs> but of the 45 picks seven were irrelevant so we're only dealing with uh what is that 38 mm -hmm. uh, relevant picks there were 10 mistakes which is 26% mistake percentage, which actually is far higher than I thought I would have, which is enlightening and good to know. Yeah. But if we look at the mistakes plus where you disagreed with the picks, there's eight more disagreements. So that's 18 total uh, mistakes plus disagreements for a 47% dis uh, like basically not uh, not Alex draft, if you will. So, <laughs> so not, not a passing grade. <laughs> 
So that no, that is definitely a failing grade. So that that's good to know. I just wanted to share that metric with everybody. Great, and, yeah. You know, we're gonna have these for each of the drafts, so it's gonna be interesting to see. And it's a great baseline, I think, right? Like that's this is great. Uh, you know, just can can only go up from here is the way to look at it, right? <laughs> of course. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Look, I'm I'm an optimist at heart. Colorless lands. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into uh, the build here. And like we said before, this is gonna be based on three things on curve synergy and mana base and then a general uh a general uh grade after got me some thoughts about uh what you're looking at when you're when you're looking at this pile so i was trying to be greedy here mm -hmm. and i was trying to figure out ways to splash both nico and narfi mm -hmm. uh, and I, but what i ended up noticing and you can see me starting to move the lands around here to add up um how many blue and green sources do I really have? Right. And it felt really low. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I ended up at was, let's see, I know the Faceless Haven stayed in. I, let's see, I can do, I have it up over here on 17 lands. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight blue. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, six, green and I, I think i was just really struggling with how to keep everything in there as you can see the faceless haven still in there which clearly is uh, a mistake um what are your thoughts i mean I'm, I'm talking a lot about the mana base but what are your thoughts on the actual deck i think the reflections ends up being the last cut here i don't think it stayed in i think i didn't notice it was in there right so just as your you know your past self is building here we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit so i think the main thing that i'm concerned about is the mana base in this deck right just like you said am i am i splashing eco am i splashing narfi am i doing you know what what combinations of things am i doing um and i think that what i would work out first like kind of like what you did is do i have the sources to have a, a structurally sound deck uh splashing anything like you know, and that'd be the first thing. Like, can I can I splash something? And I think with the Horizon Seekers, with the Replicating Ring, the Flood Plane, uh, yeah, we we certainly can so the splash something. Frost. The Glittering Frost, exactly. Um, the the baseline for splashing is when all my cards are in the deck, land spells. Do I have? And this is kind of general, but it's a good baseline. It's a good heuristic. Do I have eight sources of my main two colors? Right. Do I have eight green and eight blue somewhere in the deck, preferably on lands, of course, right? And then past that, uh, you know, that's when I can say, okay, now I can start adding a red, uh, sorry, a black source or a white source, right? Um, and and that's going to be really important for figuring out, you know, just if I'm going to be able to cast my spells. And we'll, you know, we'll see where you ended up here and we'll, we'll evaluate that after. As far as curve goes, you know, that's something that uh, is certainly going to be dictated by the, the draft. And, you know, a little bit of this uh, build score is going to be influenced by the draft, too. Um, and I'm, I, I think I will, the way it will approach this, I think I'll ding you a little bit for where we did end up in the build. Because, like I said before, um, building often happens in the draft, too. Right? So, even though this is the, the final product, of uh, this is where I'm building. The, the build happens as you're drafting. Right? Sure. So, I would say that... Uh, in this build where your current you know, configurations of spells, uh, you're lacking some early game, right? Some some two drops specifically. And we'll just pause it yeah. there, right? Yeah, and this is this I think is the final submission for the first deck. Great, great. Um, so so we're gonna look at that. Um I would say that if you had another sculptor, that fin, maybe just like three more two drops, I would say the curve is pretty darn good. One of the things when you have some really powerful five drops is that you just want really power or really solid two drops so you can get to your powerful five drops, right? You don't want to die to, you know, these uh, snow mid-range decks, they thrive on being just, just having more powerful cards than your opponents more often. But you can very easily throw that power out the window if your opponents are just playing crappy creatures and they, you know, you don't have a two drop and maybe your three drop is Wittering Frost and you just lose on the spot, you know? So I would give, uh, you know, I, I think the curve wise just because we're lacking uh some some twos our threes are okay and you know fours and fives you can never have too few fours and fives unless they're very powerful but i think specifically because the two drop slot is lacking i'd give you around a you know like a, a seven out of ten on this one basically right i think that that's it's it's 
decent, but three marks off because, you know, just those two drops are missing. Um, yeah, and, and there's none other in my, like, there's none that I didn't play. Right, exactly, like, exactly. That, like you said, that's a gap in the draft. Maybe I could have played a Depart the Realm to gain back some of that tempo. Yeah, that's like the the last, uh, <laughs> the worst case scenario, the last resort in a way where it's like, you also, you know, another thing about these uh, mid-range decks is they thrive on just having, you know, card advantage, basically. So if you're, if you're throwing away a card just for tempo, you know, that's it, sometimes it'll keep you alive, but you generally don't want to put it in there as like an early game play, right? Um, sure. You know, the, the bind the monster actually counts as a two drop, I would say, right? Where that's like, oh, that actually takes care of a two drop that's an early removal spell. Or if you have another really cheap removal spell, like a frostbite, that would count too. I could definitely forgive this these the lack of two drops if you have more cheap interaction that actually deals with the creature long term, right? But uh, I would say that, yeah, that seven out of 10 for the, the curve of this deck. Let's go uh, synergy. How about that? So uh, as far as the synergies of this deck go, well, you know, you're not like a, an uber streamlined giants deck or an uber streamlined, oh, there goes my notification here. <laughs> an uber streamlined, uh, you know, anything deck really, but with the micro synergies of the cards interacting with each other, there is still synergy, right? The Narfi is going to pump, pump your uh, your snow creatures, your Frostbeak Yetis, right? That's pretty nice. Um, I would it's say... I ended up putting a lot of counters on stuff for me too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to say the Outriders are going to be good to in this to, in this deck too. I would say where you where you lose points on synergy is the Frost Augur and Three Seasons, right? Because I, I just think those are probably anti-synergy with the deck. Not, not, like, not like they... Uh, they don't play well in the deck, but they, they won't do the thing you want them to do enough of the time, basically, <laughs> right? So I, I would say those are uh, low, like negative EV cards in this deck. Um, everything else looks pretty darn good though. Uh, I can't really complain. I mean, the Frost Peak Yetis are actually, I would say acceptable in this deck where you need a few ways to close up the game, which you don't really have. Um, you know, yeah, you don't, thinking, you don't have a six, six. Right? Yeah, and it's actually a kind of a nice combo with the Narfi and the Morag. So you, you actually did a very good job here of taking a, a somewhat medium card and making it good, right? Because these these five drops really do help. Um, so I think overall, I'll also give you a seven on that too. Uh, let's let's circle around to mana base here. So let's- That, it, that one's not gonna be a seven. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna ding you immediately for the, the faceless haven, like we said, right? Uh, if this is your final configuration, let's just do that count, right? How many green sources do we have? Do we have eight? We've got five, no, six. I think we have six. That's rough. That's like, ooh, that's almost a cardinal sin, <laughs> right? How many blue sources do we have? We have four, five, six. Again, that is very rough, right? Uh, seven. Sorry, yeah, I, I have seven. I'm miscounting. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you're like, you're like Alex. I'm not that bad, <laughs> but but still, seven is a little bit below par. And so what that comes down to is, I just don't want to play snow plains. I mean, snow plains is okay because we want to find it with uh, Nico. But I'd probably be cutting some number of like like the dual lands, right? Like the the mire and the, the sinkhole, potentially, just so we can actually fit in the uh the the requisite eight sources of each. The faceless haven is an easy cut, but we also have to make painful cuts uh, uh, elsewhere, right? And where I would say we might even end up with a swamp in the deck, like that keep that swamp basically there to go fetch the horizon seeker. I think that's perfectly acceptable. I'd say the the off-color dual lands are just too painful, too much of the time. Like, yes, they tap for one of our cards, the, you know, the Narfi, but mm -hmm. tapped colorless land is kind of a yikes. So if we just took those out, replaced them with, uh, you know, the, th the three lands I was talking about, replaced them with uh, some green sources and some blue sources, we're there. We're already there, right? We, just, we get to eight and eight. So, so you're saying cut the snow, the sinkhole, cut the mire, yeah. cut the haven, yeah. replace them with forests and islands and their appropriate amounts yep and then between those the glittering frost and the horizon seeker they can go get the plains or swamp that i need exactly and then we have the doubles we have the, the splashes okay. exactly that makes and, sense. and we have the replicating ring too so that's another source yep. right uh it's just important to be able to you know the splash colors you can find later right because they're 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 five drops right they're not in, in critical you have it in your opening hand or close to your opening hand but these blue and green cards you got you really have to have them early and that's just uh uh something that you're leading up to the numbers of saying i'm just gonna have to try to draw them early right so yeah i'm gonna give the mana base a 
a solid uh, four. <laughs> I think there are some some fundamental problems with it, I'd say. Sure. Yeah. So, so far we have three cards that you've identified differently. Mm -hmm. what, are there any other cards in the board or anything else that you would have run? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's let's look where we ended up here. Um, so I think because we, end, we did end up a little bit late on interaction, I think you can play Broken Wings. That's not a card I'm looking to play. I'm not like, oh, great, Broken Rings. But if I'm a little bit low on interaction, maybe I need a playable. I think it's going to find a target and sometimes going to find a really good target. You know, you'll, you'll blow up one of the icy manipulator cards or maybe even a good rare or an enchantment removal spell or a flyer. So I think that's a, that's a reasonable card to bring in here. Um, Would you cut the seasons or the auger for that? Probably the first one I'd cut is the auger. I think I think that's the the lowest quality card here. That's um, interesting. Okay. I, I would have thought the auger would have been okay. Obviously, as I built this, because like, how many, like, let's just do the snow math. Real sure. Quick. We have... Sculptor, Boreal, Art Rider for three, four for Glittering Frost, five for Replicating Ring, seven for Yeti, eight for Berg, nine, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We had 18 snow things. Right. I think that's like 20 is my bare Too minimum, hard. right? I think, okay. yeah, yeah. It, it's my, again, it's that, it's that drawing a card every other turn kind of idea. Yeah. Right, and it, it'll be it'll be just below that. And if we make the cuts we are planning to make, uh, you know that is even less. Obviously, I'm not gonna right. I'm not gonna pack that in. But um, so yeah, broken wings can come in, and I think the the reflections of Yara is also probably not something I want to play here. Um, no, no, that 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 was that goes out. Oh, that got cut. Great. Okay, so that this isn't the actual yeah. final build then, right? Okay, great. You you did do that. So yeah. So then three seasons. I, sorry, yeah, you're right. Three seasons. I think I would uh, swap out for. You know, it's hard because there's not a ton of great cards in the board. <laughs> you drafted so poorly. Now, <laughs> good choices. You know what? It might just be 18th land. It might be 18th land because you really want to hit land four, five, three, four, five, basically. And I don't know if we want to fore foretell anything, mm -hmm. not to make a joke on the floor, <laughs> but I do end up changing this deck at some point. Yeah, I, I did want to. I did want to talk about that. So I think the change. Correct me if you're wrong. Or, Correct me if I'm wrong. The change you made is Nico out, correct? It was Nico out, broken wings in, mm -hmm. and then that helped uh, cut the snow covered planes and uh, the face. I took the faceless haven out then too. Great, yeah. Um, thoughts on cutting Nico? So I, I did have the opportunity to use. It's a her, right? Her in a game. I think it's a they. Uh, they. Okay. Yeah, specifically. In the game, <laughs> and. I was somewhat impressed with them, but at the same time, I just felt like I didn't, I couldn't afford to splash both Nico and Narfi. I felt like mm -hmm. that was a bit much, and I got more benefit, in my opinion, out of Narfi. Gotcha. Yeah, so I would say I agree with your current configuration, because again, the sources, but if we went with the making sure we have just the eight islands, eight force, or eight red, uh, blue sources, eight green sources, I think it's responsible still to splash Nico. With the uh, with the lands and the the few pieces of fixing we have. Um, okay, so you would have um, still kept the planes in and kept Nico in. Uh, the, yeah. The so I think in. yeah, I think so. I think that's what I would do. Okay. Yeah. All right. And do we have any other metrics here for our builders? Those are the three we want. Oh, I'll, a rough leather grade, correct? Um, let's see here. Let me look at our notes. Do yeah. We <laughs> this? Yeah, we yeah, have a rough leather grade. So. Yeah. You, now, bear in mind, you have to keep this like, as objective as possible. Of course. Is this an F? No, no, oh, heavens no. This is not an F. I would give this a, uh, I'd give it a C plus. I'm, and that's, that's my honest grade. That's my honest grade. Because it's got, you know, it's got some, you know, fundamental problems with the mana, but it's got good cards, and it's got some, you know, it, it, it just has nice energy, like I mentioned. So this is definitely a deck that could win some games. Um... I don't think that, you know, I'd be guaranteed anything, but C plus is where I would land on this one. Okay. All right, and here we are with the gameplay here. Uh, and one of the, the great things about looking at this gameplay from, you know, after the fact, especially having somebody else to look over your gameplay is that you just, a lot of times you miss a lot of stuff uh, just from being, you know, tunnel visioned in your game and, and not focusing on the right things, your priorities might be in a slightly incorrect place when you're trying to figure out what matters in the game of Magic. Uh, and so one of the great things about coaching, or like I said, just having somebody else with you watching, even just watching back your own games if you record them, 
is you just get that second perspective and see things you just might not know you didn't know. So let's just jump in here. We'll stop when there's anything uh, really interesting. I think this is a clear mulligan, and I think you decided to uh, <laughs> to mulligan this hand, right? Yeah, no blue sources and three blue cards feels like yeah. a mulligan to me. And this one's okay, though. Face saving. I think I keep this and I throw the faces haven on the bottom. Right totally, there. yeah. And we'll, we'll uh, skip through anything that's not super uh, interesting, but we will, you know, do you want you, the viewer at home to have uh, a good idea of what happens in this game? Um, and, and like, yeah, like you mentioned, the faceless haven already hurting you, right? And the snow covered yeah. planes. I mean, we were going to play that anyways, but already hurting you quite a bit. Um, so well, here's that frost auger. Yeah, <laughs> the, the slightly unreliable frost auger. So they play a priest. We play a frost auger. Oh, actually, here is actually something that uh, is interesting in the way that you play Frostwalker, where depending on how, on the mix of uh, snow spells and snow lands in your deck, if you want to hit a specific thing, uh, you should be doing it at different times, basically. So if you want to... Uh, or oh, sorry, sorry, not that's not true. It's it's the opposite. It's, it's, if you don't have to count the snow lands or snow spells, it's just like, do you want a snow card or a non-snow card, right? right. Uh, if you're looking for a specific thing, so if you're looking for a snow card, uh, particular, um, you should be doing it at uh, the after you've drawn, and if you're looking for a not snow card, you should be doing it before you've drawn during your draw step, right? Because if you think about the permutations. If there is a snow card on top and you're looking for a non-snow card, well, you want to draw that for your draw step. And if you snow auger or if you frost auger, you're going to hit the non-snow card and you're not going to be able to draw it, right? So you want to do uh, do it before. But if the other if the other thing is true, if the other opposite is true, you want to wait till you draw your card and get one deeper to try to find that snow card, right? Does that does that make sense? It? Or yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah okay. I, I cool. I don't remember the opening hand. Was the plane the island was in the opening hands? Would you have gone island frost auger on turn one? Uh, instead of the tap plane? Yeah, that's yeah, I believe I would have. Uh just because okay. yeah, just because you get down and you can still you know, you can even play the planes here. Um so to start activating. You can discard that snake go veil that you didn't want me to have. Yeah. <laughs> like opponent opponent's helping me out here. Yeah. Alright, so we go here, and here is actually an, uh, a moment where I believe Yeah, so you passed the turn here, you played your land. I think it's probably better to just activate there because you have uh, tapped, you have tap lands in your deck, right? So if the top card of your library is a tap land, especially if it's a tap green source, you're really gonna wanna play it on on, on your turn there, right? Um, sure. Whereas like missing a point of, you know, they're gonna be able to attack you for a point, not a huge deal, basically. Um, so I would have activated it on, on my turn there was the first, first little thing I would have yeah. noticed. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, so we I go think on. I'm so used to saying like, "Oh, this should happen at the end of turn." You exactly know, right. It's effects. all of these tap abilities, these activated abilities. They can, you know, you really got to think about them. And of course, we do activate the end of turn. They play a card door, which is bad news for us for sure. We did draw a land, so that's kind of nice. And look, actually, and it was a funny enough, it was there. a tap land, right? Uh, we would have been able to play it and play Inga and have an untapped land next turn. Maybe play a four drop and activate Frost Stalker, right? So. We got, we got bailed out yeah. a little bit by drawing an untapped land. Uh, I think I activated here just because I didn't want to have him attack. Yeah, that's a, that, that's pretty interesting, right? I, I think I agree. At the same time, let's pause there for a second. It is pretty interesting it's because it's like... Runize down, right? Yeah, because we get the runize down and it's a good blocker for card drawer. Um, so basically, like we would give up the Frost Augur. I think if we were being pressured a little bit more, I think you just play the Inger runize. But I think being at 20 still, I think you can hold off for one turn, basically, is the way I would think about it, right? If you really needed to trade off, you play the end of that turn and just give up the Frost Auger, but I agree with waiting a turn I, here. I think my other concern was that they might be able, uh, my, my, I might be off a turn. No, I was worried about them dropping that and then activating the Priest mm -hmm. to kill the Inga. Yeah. And then I would have done an Inga and a Frost Auger. Right, if they play a land. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a real consideration as well. And they play, oof. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a rough start. Yeah, it's a rough start. Off, off, honestly, off a, uh, you know, the the opponent's getting a little bit luckier on their mana base than we are. Although we're not doing too bad here. This is pretty interesting too. So you choose to play the Inga uh, instead of the the Nico, where Nico could, you know, negative to kill Cardor. I think 
I agree with your your choice here. Not saying, you know, not at all disagreeing. I'm just saying it's an interesting conversation to have. Maybe the Nico uh, eventually is able to kill us as the only creature on the battlefield. Hopefully, <laughs> that's the hope. And I think I would just be looking to trade here. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I figured as soon as if I put Nico down, the Predator would just kill it. Yeah, just so eat it up. Like, let's set up some turns and see if I can use Nico to kill the Predator. So here's a pretty interesting... Uh, crew of cards here what do you think about this um i think i what did i do here i don't really recall um i think i kept the berg strider and the bind and i put the three seasons on the bottom uh that's, that's what yeah that's what i would do and probably be in that order right like berg strider um as a blocker and locking down the predator and then bind the monsters on as the next one we bought them to buy the monster. So maybe the thought there is you're taking just too much damage. Yeah. I, and I, in my notes here, I wrote down, I really wasn't sure about whether I was going to Nico or do the bind. Yeah. And I, and I, if, yeah, I went back and forth on this a lot. I, I kind of actually buy bottoming the bind the monster because it's like, you know, like I said, it's going to take deal a lot of damage. And I think the way you win this game is uh, keeping pace with them and trying to pressure them, basically. So if you can tap down their creature for a turn and then get some creatures on board to, you know, to, to just <laughs> race them, basically. Not that we're in a great position to race, but I think that's your best chance of winning. Because look, this Berg, this, uh, sorry, not this Berg Strider, this uh, Predator here, that's just going to kill you, right? Like, yeah. you you uh, you don't have any, like, removal that can really deal with this thing in your deck. Um, so you really just have to hope, okay, let's see if I can get some creatures down and try to race. So I actually do think bottoming the bind is actually... Pretty pretty interesting, and I think it's what I had done as well. Um, I actually ended up keeping it. If I'm oh, sorry. Did you that. did you end up keeping it? Ah, uh, okay. I did. Yeah, but I mean, it was really tough. And I just want to point out one other thing. Yeah. Look how look at all the green cards in my hand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's the other thing. Bottom. If you bottom the bind, you get one closer to a green source. This is my first time playing against that Immerstorm Predator. Man, he, he is tough. Well, hopefully, it's the last. Yeah. So they ended up using their uh, priest to kill uh, Inga there. All right, which is you know fa fair. It's fine. Yep, you block. I agree with that. Just just saving some points of damage here. Reactivate. Mm -hmm. We draw the Berg Strider. We'll move on here yeah, a little that's bit. That's why I put the Berg. Uh, so I'm going to be completely transparent. Yeah. I didn't think about the putting the bird first because of the auger. Mm. I really didn't think about that. I just lucked into just it. Just lucked into it. Yeah, yeah. That's, well, it's good. He you you draws you an extra <laughs> card off of it. So we go for the tap that down, block that. That's the play we're looking for here. Yep. We keep going here. Whoops. Sorry. Let's get started to, so this, in the next turn, I was really torn between casting the bind or trying to do Nico. Mm -hmm. And I think I ended up landing on Nico to kill the predator. Well, it's interesting. And I, and then I thought, oh, maybe that's why I stabilize a little bit. Well, that's interesting because I think I, I actually I, I watched this game before. And I believe an opponent made a fairly critical misplay as they just didn't sacrifice their disciple when you activated Nico because you do go Nico negative, right? Oh, so this is me not knowing the cards. Maybe I lucked out. The predator can sacrifice something to get indestructible. Or I something? believe so. Let me just you know double check the wording on this card, but I'm I'm pretty sure. I trust you on that. So then that was then it's not even a close decision. It's just buying. Right? Yeah, exactly. If if we're playing with like the opponent is uh, no no also knows all the words on the cards, you know. Let's see. Yep. Sacrifice another creature, gains indestructible until the end of turn. So, yeah, totally. Oh, so then, so then the play would be fine. And then a punt on their end. So then, and then there's not even a question there. It's Boreal Outrider and then bind to something. Mm -hmm. I almost wonder right. if that's just the better play, even if it doesn't have that text. So that's kind of interesting, too. Might just be better to, you know, reserve this Nico for, uh, for something else. If, if we just have a clean yeah. removal spell there. What do you think about that scry? Should I have kept that? Yeah, great question. Or... Uh, I think yes, because I think you need to start double spelling, right? With only one green source, I, I don't think you can uh, you can just you know, deploy these one at a time. I think I think now my big picture goal in this game is just to uh, 
just to start turning the corner. Kill him as fast as possible now, <laughs> right? Uh, sure. The Nico is going to help for sure, but uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. So hypothetically, I should be at five. There should be a bind on that predator, and no, and Nico still in hand. And yeah, I Rider in play. I believe so. Okay, so looking not too bad for us here. And if I berserker, okay. And the last card? On that card, I haven't really been that impressed with that card. Yeah, I think this card is medium, basically. Like it, it's very good when you cast it early, very medium when you cast it late. Um, I think the if you look at the seventeen lands data for this card, it has a, actually a, pr a surprisingly low win rate. I believe Andrew Cuneo put posted on Twitter that this card has the highest delta between where people take it and how good it actually is based on <laughs> based on the data. So sure. no, you. Know, I don't know how much you want to read into that exactly, but just a little food for thought there. So we can kill something here, or we can just plus. That's an interesting conversation to have. Actually, what's your take on this turn? Because this is a complex turn. What, what do you like doing here? What? Well, let me remember what I did here. Or, yeah, do you want if we uh, look at it, or you, or we just talk about what what your thoughts are. You want to look at it first? The, let's see here. I, I think I activate Nico because she was going to die anyway. I well, we can just—that's what I did. Yeah, yeah. We we could plus and trade, like we could plus, uh, kill something, trade here, keep them alive. That's a play. Well, how do you how do you plus and kill something? Uh, sorry, plus Pardon? and then bind the monster on something is is what I meant to say, right? And then we can just plus. trade with the. So, so we play. So we plus the Nico goes up to two. Uh -huh. We bind, let's say the Draugr, uh, and then we. Yeah, I think that's what I did. Okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. I, I bound. I actually, I think I bound the berserker because I was worried about it getting menace. Oh no, I wanted, didn't want them to bring back the image. Yeah, I think I think that's the priority for sure. And then I was trying to figure out if I could glitter and frost, and cast another creature, and I think that's what I did. Uh, you generally want to glitter and frost the non snow land, just so you can have additional, uh, an additional snow land. Got it. Yeah. Small little thing, thing there, and then that, so that that is your play. So basically, yeah, no, I I totally agree with that play. There's nothing, nothing, okay. nothing. Uh, I would disagree there. And let's see, I'm curious because don't cry. I don't actually remember how this this turned out from this point. So yeah, I don't, and this is nice because like we've recorded them. So just for full transparency, people, I recorded this about like a week ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's getting back up to speed on the format. Or not the format, but like what, what we did in this game. I think I chump and uh, let the disciple ping him for a while. <sighs> that, that Necromancer is a really, really rough card for you to see here, basically, right? Because now yeah. trades are just terrible for you. Um, yeah, so so... It's hard for you to come back from the situation, but now in these spots where it's like, what do you even do? Um, I'd be looking at, do you, do you tend to keep your deck list with you or like a picture of your deck? No, I don't. I would be looking at this spot because it's very easy to just play out my cards and be like, well, whatever happens, happens, right? Um, to maybe, maybe there's an out in your deck and I, I can't think of it offhand where it's better to just chump this turn or play like something that you're planning on chumping with like a small creature that you don't care about them getting with the necromancer and then hope to draw that thing right i'm trying i you know if you had like a, a a removal spell for example you don't you don't have many removal spells in your deck but if you had some yeah we do yeah it would be interesting to just say maybe we you know you still play the creatures out but that it affects how you uh how you would block right because we we make trades here but it's quite bad because they just get it <laughs> right and in fact, I would probably say, and I think you might have come came to this conclusion, where it's like, okay, I, I actually have to play this, because if they play this, then they'll get the unblockable creature, which I definitely can't... Uh... Oh, oh, no, you, you wanted to get the second counter. That, that makes sense, too. Yeah, I wanted to make a 5-5. Yeah. And that's a good play. That's a very good play. So so this is what you do. Um, but I would say that there are certain times, and this this is not one of those times, um, that I see where your play was, and it was a very good play, that when you're at this stage of the game... It's very easy to concentrate on just what is in your hand. And it's uh, it's really important to say like, oh, I have this card in my deck. Maybe that makes me play a little bit better. Like a removal spell, like XYZ, right? So that's just sure. one other thing I would say. Helps to play with a, a copy of your deck. I think at this point, my game plan was 
I have a five five I can make unblockable. Yep. Let's, uh, four let's turn, turn clock. <laughs> yeah, four turn clock. Unfortunately, it's five because they gained a life. They think, they think, they think, and they play. They play a sculptor. Okay. So we go on here. We get in for five. Yep. I'll tell you what, two Outriders really make some big things. Yeah, yeah, they are large. And I think you're um, thinking, should I, I play out this Masked Vandal, basically? Yeah, and I just decided not to. I, I didn't know what kind of enchantments they might have. Yeah, I think I agree with not doing that, basically. Like, it doesn't, like, right now we... So the reason to play it out is to play around a removal spell. But even still, they're going to remove the Yeti, probably, not anything else. So it's not, it's not like they had to remove a blocker. Um, so the reason to play the Vandal is to like have an additional blocker. I don't think that additional blocker is going to matter. So I agree with that. Okay. And then I have like an ice bind pillar or something that you need to kill. And we, we go on. Yeah, that, card's a, that card's a pain. Yeah. Uh, I think I eventually just went for it. And they have, <laughs> they have blood on the snow. Then, yeah. Brutal. I ran into a lot of, uh. Was it three rares there? The Necromancy, the Blood on the Snow, yeah. the Predator. Yeah, so I think overall, I think uh, aside from a few, you know, sequencing things here in the early game, you played pretty well, actually. You played pretty well, um, but of course, you know, you can only play so well yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they did something to bring back the uh, Immature Predator, and right. the Predator uh, was the Coup de Gras. Right, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's go on to the next game. How about that? All right, here we are in the next game here. Um, just to give fill everybody in, as I alluded to in deck building, I was kind of worried about the mana base, so I did switch the deck up as we talked about. Brought in the broken wings and took out the, the uh, what was it, the faceless, whatever that that card, a faceless haven. I took that guy out. Yeah. Because uh, I, I had so many <laughs> green cards stuck in my hand. Yeah, I realized that the mana base was not not helping working in your favor, basically. And that's an interesting uh, mulligan here, I think. So give me your thoughts on this. Uh, let's see here. Did I already mulligan here? No. Uh, this is this is your this, opening hand, this, but you, you um, chose to mulligan. This was a mulligan for. I think I should mulligan here. There's basically only one card that's castable if I don't draw an island. So I. Real outlander. I would tend to. Uh, yeah, I would tend to mulligan this hand too, right? And and one of the things you want to think about is like, you know, you can just run it through the hypergeometric calculator, right? Just like. But how likely am I to draw island? And I think in this hand on the play, you're like, uh, it's only like 60-ish percent, which is not very high. Uh, you're maybe even sub that a little bit. If- yeah, there's eight islands in the deck. Yeah. If this snow field was a, an island, do you keep this hand? I think I would. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I think I would, because the bind the monster can keep the deck alive for a little bit. And then any land lets you cast but the board outrider costs three, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I think I keep. Yeah, totally. I I, I tend to keep two landers with at least some amount of early place, right? If you, if you had like, you know, all four drops, that's a different story. But you know, and again, this this like quote unquote colorless tapped land, right? All hurting hurting sure, our mana base once else, again, yeah. right? How you have so it's these like sneaky things just here and there that uh, that lead to losses sometimes. All right, so we keep that. I agree with bottoming the three seasons because it's not going to get you back anything very soon. You can blindly play it, but I don't think that's a great idea. At least not in this hand. Now, Alex, how, how much decision making is in this deck, in this game? Not a lot, I would say. So you get pretty trans. So we'll probably, you know, we're showing this game just so people can see it. Um, but, you know, this is one of the games where eh, you got pretty trans here. I will say, though, I think you probably should have just, just, Got that out of the way with the bind. Um, okay, I, and I and I make that decision after this. Once they cast the second one, I was like, I can't, um, I can't afford to have two berserkers out there. So I and I wanted to do it before they got more plus one plus one counters. So I would say you're saying you would have done that before the replicating ring. Uh, no, no, no. I would have played ring and then just just cast bound. Uh, just cast fine. Okay, got yeah, it. yeah. I think I think your your logic is correct. You cannot have these on the battlefield; they will kill you. But I think uh, I would take that a step further and say, like, or sorry, you're. Or you, I know the way you phrased it was, uh, you know, I, I don't want like this is going to get out of hand. Um, it's going to get some counters. I should deal with it. I think just preemptively, just get rid of it. This is when it's going to 
be the least threatening. It's going to be a one power creature, only going to deal you one damage off the bind, and you're not going to have to worry about it. So I would just snap off, kill the thing right here, right? Especially when your hand does not have a lot of action in it. Like, if you hypothetically had a bunch of creatures in hand, you could, like, use the bind in a racing situation, tap down a key blocker or something. Right now, you're going to just stay alive until I can draw more cards mode, right? And I think it's really critical just to kill this two drop. Yeah, I have three in hand, and they have, what, a full seven? Of yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, even in a game when where you know there's not a ton of uh you know you get trounced like we said i think there are some pretty interesting decisions to be made so what do you do here also kind of interesting uh, i definitely think i bind. i i can only do one thing right, yes of all of these and i think i cast bind on the berserker and then i trade i wanted to trade with the auger and activate so i would say it's probably just better to play the inga here and for a few reasons um okay. one you've got two five drops in your hand so if you can guarantee you know scrying three is pretty close to guaranteeing hitting a land next turn right that's huge but the thing the bigger thing is just using all your mana when you're tight on mana it's going to be really really important to right uh to just use you know cast that four drop and the thing is you can still do the same thing where you trade off one of the berserkers with uh, if, if they if they grow it, they play a, a land, play a two, play a one, or something like that. You can still just double block with Inga and Frostalker, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, they're gonna have two Berserkers coming at you, but you can still double block and it'll be good for you. Um, and you set up that five, right? So I think all those things considered makes the Inga a you know, pretty markedly markedly better play. So going back, you know, not casting bind on the other turn really constrained me here. Exactly, too. exactly. And then they. They cast, ooh, did they cast double one drop here? They do, oof. Yeah, and so now if we're having some thinking about what would have happened if we did cast the Inga. Now we still wouldn't have been able to block, but you know, maybe we, again, maybe we make sure we hit that fifth land drop and start to stabilize. Sure. And we'd have a blocker for you know double blocks in the future. So tap land is really painful here. Yep. Can't I think we'll fast forward a little bit. Yeah, we cast the only thing we can cast. I think we would probably... I would tend to just bottom all of these. Uh, I don't think we need... Okay. That was them. actually a question. Yeah. Do you top deck that Nerfie or not? Uh, not with another Nerfie in play, right? Because we are sorry, in hand, right? Because we... You know, it's legendary number one, so we can't play two of them. Um, but if they kill this Nerfie, we can just bring it back because we have enough snow, snow cards or snow lands, right? So... I think that'd be a no for me. Uh, there's just no, okay. there's no reason and to. And I think that I do end up topping it, so yeah. I think that's a mistake. All right, and we move forward a little bit. They make, they go for an attack, but you run get you get run amucked, unfortunately, because you know it's just a, it's an, a, an additional copy that doesn't do anything right now, right? Is the, is my yeah, logic here? That's great. That's a great point. Let's see. I, I think we'll see another card. We can see if if getting that card earlier would have made a big difference. Hmm. Top plan yeah, might have. Tap plan made it made a difference, yeah. Now we play the Narfi. Yep, I agree with that. Let me fast forward a little bit. They go for an attack. And I think, yeah, a big old attack here where they start to double yeah, spell and I, I, I forget what killed me in this. And, and so I think, you know, I think it does start to run away from you a little bit here. There's not too much you could have done. They're just their their board's just better than yours. I do think, though, you know, you're saying at the beginning, is there much you could have done? I think this game would have yeah, played out yeah. quite a bit this differently. A learning lesson, yeah. Yeah, I think it would have been quite a bit differently if you just, uh, you know, got the threat out of the way. And, you know, the two things here that would have made a difference, I think. Uh, casting the Bind early and casting the Inga on turn four, right? And the two concepts that I would take away from that are, uh, you know, as the control deck, which I think you are in this matchup facing a red deck, you just want to kill her things just straight up, right? Just like if, if you see an early threat that you can't block, you got to kill it, basically. And, and you're not going to be able to block that menace creature for uh, for very long. And the second thing is, in the early points of the game, it's like 90% correct to just use all your mana when you can. Sometimes you, you don't, or you're not able to. But imagine in a world where you, you uh, had the Inga and you scried, maybe you didn't even hit on land, but you drew a three drop. Because then you can go... On turn five, I didn't hit my fifth land, but I hit a three drop and I cast bind, right? And that's just way more mana efficient. Using all the mana early is, is really important. So that, that was to be my takeaways from this this game. Sure. All right, and home stretch here. Let's look at our final game here. So just just to recap, we're 0-2. Yeah, we are 0-2. We're in the, uh, trying to make a, a big old comeback here. 
So if I keep this, I play everything off curve the entire game, basically. But I do think I keep it. I think so too. It's pretty darn rough, but you have a two drop, which is cast again, cast on turn three. Although, you know, you could draw a two drop on, or uh, untapped land at some point. So we'll just fast forward a little bit here. Play lands. Yeah, this one was a pretty slow burn. We just play, each of us are playing lands. Yeah, you're kind of like a, a snow controlling deck versus snow controlling deck. Oh, Yeti's nice. Yeah, I agree with Yeti. They don't attack. Yeah, would you have Yeti there over Inga? Uh, no, no, no. I agree with the Yeti there. Because I think if you... Like, I think you want to get this into play this turn so that you can mar it next turn, is my logic. Yep. Oh, they just sacrificed their Yeti for... Okay, that's interesting. Yeti trade. Yep. Was... <laughs> That one, probably not. <laughs> not Probably not a good fit. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I had to copy my thing. So we, we do actually have a decision here, right? Because the Arnie slays the troll, we could play our five drop, or we just play our mass vandal and kill the Arnie slays the troll. That's what you end up doing. Yeah, so. And I actually think it's yeah. a pretty heads up play here. Yeah. I, I, I think- I was worried that they were gonna pump their thing. Right, it's gonna be a five power creature. We can trade with the Narfi. I think that's reasonable too. Um, but like them getting additional mana, um, like, there's a lot of things that start to go wrong there, I think. So I, I would tend to just just get that out of the way. Even though this goes against what I've seen before, of just being ma more mana efficient, right? I think that is the one time where it's like, okay, and, and this is, I'm gonna stop here for a second, but this is one of the points where it does get tricky. When, if you're trying to uh, play your game based on just heuristics in general, um, you know, I just said, use all your mana in the early turns, but there I said, don't use all your mana, just cast the Mass yeah. Vandal, right? Um, that is an that you know that play there, which I agree with, is a bit of an exception to the rule. Um, and there's even an argument for just casting Narfi there and trading off, right? They have a they're, they're only going to have a four toughness creature. You could have used all your mana and just trade off with the mentor. Um, but I do think that one of the trickier things in Magic in general is just trying to break away from heuristics uh, and, and knowing when to. And that that comes with experience, of course. But I think for the most part, if you follow the heuristic of, of just use all your mana, it's going to get you pretty far. Sure. Cast yeah, the Mistwalker. Mist Walker. So I don't think much happens here for a little bit if you wanted to. Yeah, skip let's ahead. fast I, I forward a little bit. Uh, I don't remember. I think I looks like I bottomed everything there. I actually would probably just cast the uh, the Narfi there myself. Um, so so there really we can, good. you you set up your next few draws, but Narfi starts attacking, whereas Inga just trades, right? They're not going to want to okay. trade with the Narfi, where, uh, the, you know, Inga, they'll, they'll be okay with trading, I would say. So I, I would actually just cast the Narfi there. Um, my okay. goal at this point is probably, you know, we're in a fairly parody situation where I think either of us could take the beatdown roll, and I would generally tend to want to take that beatdown roll when I can. So if the Narfi can come down, it's going to block pretty well, going to attack pretty well, I, I would probably just play the Narfi. And you have the three snow lands. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. So we go on here, make a trade. It's totally fine. Cast an Arfi to cast that bear. <laughs> you know, my good friend the bear here. Yeah, there's your 5-5. Five five. This is the first game that I ran into it. And I, was, I was kind of impressed. It was, like you said, it's kind of a beater. And they bind the monster on your Narfi. That's a rough... Yeah, that's. A, is there a way we could have prevented I had, that? I had, the, I had the veil. Well... Oh, so you cast it, or sorry, you cast it in response. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Sorry, I, I thought you tapped. When I looked there, your, your green was tapped, and I thought you were uh, tapped out of the green mana. So, totally okay. Now, if, if the like, Moret cap copies here, mm -hmm. it's not not legend. If you copy Narfi, you only get to keep one. Yeah, right? you still so only get to keep one, because it says, yeah, still legendary. So. Yeah. And that's, so this, is another, this is another point where I would have just attacked with the Narfi. Because they don't have good blocks with you having snow, snow, snow in play, and you still have good blocks, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, okay. You can still you can get That's an attack point. there. I think I have trouble knowing when to turn the corner, so that would have been a good idea. Unless you're very far behind, like that previous game, um, and I think maybe we're identifying a, a route we can go down for future uh, episodes, future uh, sessions. Unless you're very far behind, and you know you should be blocking, it's uh, it's it's a good idea to try to take the reins and say, okay, let's see if I can close up this game reasonably, right? Say, I, I'm going to take the driver's seat here, right? So I think, you know, uh, you know, we'll get into this a little later, but I'd say uh, your homework for this week might be to start to identify consciously, am I the beat down in this role or am I not, right? Because if you just start to consciously do it, 
you'll start to subconsciously do it when you know when it becomes second nature and that makes your plays a lot easier sure yeah because they didn't have any good attacks back yeah the mass vandal exactly the six would have yeah could just jump anything you block you know, there you you, you block this there general. and especially with them having missed walker in play you really want to try to race that because they they have um they are the ones with the, the better clock right now right so if you're not pressuring then they're just going to run away with this the game by by attacking with this flyer yeah but i realized it there so i was about a turn late right? yeah exactly and of 15. yep and exactly and, and that might matter who knows right so we play that all right that's fine that's a little annoying it's gonna might in this game i don't remember it's gonna it's gonna grow that thing yeah glimpse of the cosmos that's a good draw we get to dig very deep here there's a bind probably just want to take that <laughs> You do end up taking it, and because I, I wanted to put it on that the Jara Glade Warden because I was worried about them growing things. Oh, interesting. I think the more pressing threat is the the Mistwalker. Well, yeah. now it's not, not anymore, <laughs> and that's why it's good to cast the uh, the glimpse before you cast the the bind, like you know the second half of the glimpse, anyways. So if you didn't draw that Broken Wings, I think you just have to to take out this Mistwalker, right? Because that's okay. just going to kill and you. I would, and I would have made a mistake there, then. I would have cast it on the... On the, on the Glade Warden, Ward. yeah. The logic is this kills you in two turns. This might kill you across, you know, a lot of turns, but... Um, at least at least you're, you're going to be fine, you know, yeah. in the next few turns here. So now it should be 10 to 5, right? Yeah. Or 10 to... You know, 15 to 5, and they have one less creature. I think I would just... On my turn, kill the Mistwalker here with the Broken Wings. I think the risk... So the advantage you get from not doing it is you make them tap out, basically, and pump their Mistwalker yeah. and make you make you, uh, make you you try to... Uh, or make them try to skip their turn, basically. But I think... That's what I was trying to do, yep. I think it's so critical that you just kill his Mistwalker because if they happen to draw into a Counterspell or they happen to draw into their own Snakeskin Veil... It's really bad. You just lose on the spot, it's, basically, it's right? Over, yeah. So I think the advantage you gain isn't isn't enough. And I, I would have just broken wings when, when they didn't have any cards in hand. Okay. You can just pass away. They pump it, I kill it. Yeah. And we're, you know, they'd be at they'd be at five here. Then they drop dragon. And that's pretty Dragon's darn good. Berserker. Yeah. And that's actually key, because they wouldn't have had to, they wouldn't have been able to take that damage they would have had to you know basically chumped with the the outrider because you can bring the narfi back right or or with this yeah. right so that would have been a bit of value uh you get the yeah we get the dragon here but i'm assuming well we have a we have a we draw and behold the multiverse we do oh and i just wanted to bring this up for yeah taking notes for myself sure um, I didn't play the Glittering Foss and the Replicating Ring previously, thinking mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, I have enough mana. And then I drew the Behold, and I was like, well, what if I, like, exactly. what if I want to Behold and play something? Exactly. Um, so that was a mistake. If you have ways to, like, use these cards, like, you have, like, looting or rummaging effects, sure. But, yeah, exactly. With, with card draw in your deck, you got you got to play out your, your, uh, your mana sources. So we go ahead and behold here, and I draw into two creatures, and yeah. I have a 5-5 five, five flyer. And so. that is it. <laughs> All right. And so that was an 0-3 draft. Yeah. And so, you know, I think overall, if we're good to give you a rating on your gameplay here, I'd give you a solid, you know, B-, minus. I would say. It wasn't terrible by any means, uh, but there were a lot of things that you could have done to just tighten up, basically. And, and yeah. I think in some of the games, some percentage of the games, that would have mattered, right? Yeah. So... I think overall, I think like, it seems generous. I'm gonna be honest. Like, yeah, you wanted to bump it down to C plus. <laughs> I think that's. I think I'd give it a C. Okay. C plus. Okay. Let's go. Let's go C plus. The feedback then. you shared, because one of the things I share for people listening at home is it, it. My impression of some of those games was there was nothing that I could have done. Right. And having had this conversation, you pointed out some errors that there were things I could have done. Uh -huh. So, I think B minus is generous. Okay. So let's go C plus then. I think, I think a lot of your general in-and-out turn-to-turn plays were decent. There were some uh, sequencing things. There were some just, you know, things, you know, threat prioritization on your side and the opponent's side of things you needed to deal with or things that you should have considered your own threats and beating down with that I think is something that you can look into for, uh, for your future games. But, yeah, overall, um, 
I guess we'll move on to our closing section here, which is just uh, a wrap up of you know the draft, the gameplay, the build, and some thoughts. Sure. So I would say that uh, you know we, we already went over a lot of the things when we talked about the draft and we've been talking here. But my takeaway uh, from the draft portion is if you're drafting this these snow decks, um, your mana base is your priority, basically, right? You really, really got to ensure you have a good mana base or else you're not going to be able to play your good cards, <laughs> right? And you did a pretty good job of that, I would say. Um, where we noted that you might have faltered a little bit is in the build where you just didn't have enough sources to reliably cast your cards. And you remedied that a little bit. Um, but putting... Like, uh, you know, I would say that bad mana is, is a silent killer. And we kind of saw that, mm -hmm. I think, in our, our first game. Where it's just like, yeah, your spells were fine, but you couldn't cast them. <laughs> All right? Yeah. So, really focus on that. Um, we talked about before, be a little bit open to not pigeon your, pigeonholing yourself at the beginning of the draft, at, the, at pack one. Really trying to say, you know, contextualize the draft, given the packs you've seen. Given your dialogue, I actually think you have a pretty good uh, running dialogues, working memory of, of what you've seen, what you've passed, stuff like that. Some people have, have trouble remembering that stuff, but you actually actually did, did a pretty good job of that. I'm not sure how much that translates into real time, but that skill of noting what you saw and you know what you're likely to see, like you noted in one of those packs, hey, I, we passed a lot of red cards, that makes sense why we're seeing uh, no red cards this pack, stuff like that, right? So if you can implement that a little more into your own navigation, right, and saying like, this is what I think, based on what I've seen, this is what I think I'm going to be more likely to say in the future, or more likely to see in the future packs, uh, and make decisions based off that. So things like, hey, I haven't seen a lot of snowlands. Maybe I need to really prioritize these snowlands I'm seeing now because I won't see them later because the table's prioritizing them, right? Stuff like that. Um, so that's the draft. And for the gameplay, you know, we, we, we just went over some of that stuff, but just to recap, uh, who's the beatdown, I think is a, is a core fundamental thing. And uh, just those small sequencing things, which, mind you, is mostly because uh, it's it's some of your first games of the format, and those kind of things uh, are become become easier to spot once you've played a little bit more. Sure. Um, do we want to take a second to go over the other two? We're not going to go into this level of detail, but do we want to just recap uh, the grade and, and the results of those two? Yeah. So let's take a look at that, just for the transparency's sake. One of the things is that uh, Nathan, we, we, we were saying before, is that we really wanted for Nathan's sake, be very, uh, you know, stringent with the, the the grading system. So I think every week we're probably going to give you, the viewer, only one draft and gameplay to look at. But for his own process uh, and his own progress, we're going to see, you know, Nathan doesn't want to leave out any of the games and be like, well, this is the one we're looking at. This is the one we're grading. That's how we're looking at the process. So on our own, I'm going to go through the drafts and give him uh, a grade. We're going to post the links to those drafts if you want to see them, uh, just the 17 lands logs in the description there. Um, and if you want to check those out, feel free. But uh, we'll also post the score up on screen now for uh, Nathan's other other drafts and, and the results for those drafts. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I guess just to, to talk through them real quick, uh, one was 6-3 uh, and one was 4-3. Um, the 6-3 uh, was a more aggro deck, uh -huh. and the 4-3 um, was a deck that I really struggled with in terms of whether it should be mono white or white splashing blue. Um, so they both ended up being kind of interesting drafts as well, in my opinion. All right, let's wrap things up from there, Nathan. Uh, this was great as our first foray into this. Uh, viewers, if you'd like to give us some feedback, uh, please let us know in the comments on, uh, you know, you can message me on Twitter. I am cord underscore O underscore calls uh, on Twitter. I also stream on Twitch by under the same name. Um, if you would like to give feedback, you can do it there or on uh, the limited level ups discord, which is the discord for my podcast. I'll put that note. Uh, I'll put that link in the description and it's probably gonna be up on the screen as well. Um, I think that'll do it from here. Do you have any closing words? Any thoughts yourself here? No, this is great. I mean, this is a first step in the process. I'm excited about being transparent and sharing this with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, following along with my journey, if you're interested, it'll be, be good. And then if this motivates you, you know, uh, try checking out coaching yourself. You might have some gaps that you haven't seen yet. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'm Nathan at leveling up lives on Twitter uh, <laughs> or email me at Nathan at leveling up lives dot com. Uh, leveling up lives is um, the goal is to take stuff like this and, and like uh, 
Alex said at the beginning of our, our, group, our session here is, you know, to try to give back to charity in some way, shape or form. And so still flushing out how to do that, but uh, that's the goal. Yep. Yeah. And I would, you know, emphasize that uh, again, this, we, we didn't notice, or we didn't notice the, uh, the beginning of this, but, you know, check out the links we have in the uh, description. If, if it's a, you know, if you're interested in giving to a nonprofit, check it out. And uh, yeah, because that is ultimately one of our goals here. All right, viewer, Nathan, I think we'll sign off here. All right, thanks, Alex. All right, see ya.